I just want to check in. I know that we're uh, at one o'clock right now. Uh, Sean and Akeem, are you on the line? I'm here. Great, thank you, Akeem. And Sean, are you there? Okay. Maybe hopping on here in a little bit. Um, Oh yeah, he's logging in now. Okay. So um, I will go ahead and kick this off since it's one o'clock, 1 p.m. here on the Eastern side to kickstart this. So welcome back. Uh, thank you all for those folks. Again, this is the hospital work group room. Um, so if you're in here um, from the PAC LTC, that was the different link. Um, so this is the hospital work group room. Uh, we'll be going over the measures for the hospital quality improvement programs. Um, you can see again, some housekeeping reminders similar to uh, what was listed previously um, this morning, uh, just keeping yourself on mute. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting. Uh, so we encourage you to use the video feature once you're chatting, um, you're not obligated to, but we encourage it um, just so we can see your faces as you're talking. Um, we also encourage you to use the raise hand feature as well during the discussion. If, you, if you'd like to, we would then call on you and monitor uh, your, your participation that way or uh, through the chat box, we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, for those members of the public, there will be public commenting uh, portions of the meeting. So uh, during those portions, you're, you're more than welcome to submit your comments through the chat um, and try to leave some space as well for those who are dialing in. Um, and also as, a, as another reminder for the work group uh, meeting uh, folks, uh, the poll everywhere link. So again, that is the link that we'll be using to vote on the measures for consideration. That is a separate link from the Zoom meeting. It is a poll everywhere link. It was sent via email earlier this morning. So um, for those of you that have it, have it opened up and tested, thank you very much. Um, but for those of you that maybe haven't tested it yet, please go into it um, just so you can pull it up and get, get it running and test it. We have, uh, I think, a uh, few, few folks that still need to open it up and, and test it. Again, we need to use that feature for voting and um, also to help us monitor quorum. Um, Becky, if you could flip back to the team slide, uh, that would be great. Um, just wanted to recognize uh, the staff uh, um, as been very much instrumental in the background and, and supporting these efforts to date. We both have the MAP Hospital and also the MAC PAC LTC that were uh, also uh, on the meeting this morning. But as you can see listed here, we have quite a few folks that have been supporting the efforts of this, of this, of this cycle. Um, and on the MAP Hospital side, myself, uh, Matthew Pickering, Senior Director, we also have Samuel Stolpe. Um, Dr. Stolpe has been with uh, NQF um, and MAP previously. Uh, he has been supporting and also leading the clinician side as well, Udara who all of you have heard from earlier today, who's our senior manager. Katie Berryman is our project manager and Chris Dawson, another manager on, on the MAP Hospital as well, who will be helping with our voting procedures today. Um, and Kara Lee, who is also a manager from the coordinating committee and, and definitely has been integral in making sure to keep things moving um, and leading up to the coordinating committee. Uh, and Becky Payne, who is our analyst, who has, who has been very supportive with making sure you all get all of your materials um, so that you can review them um, and getting those, uh, getting you ready for today's meeting. And then we heard from Michael Haney, who is our managing director here at NQF, and also Tarun Amin, who's, who's our consultant. Just wanted to recognize these individuals as well and thank them for all of their time and, and effort leading up to the meeting today and moving forward. Um, I'm just going to check in again. Sean, are you able to, were you able to join? Yep, I'm here. Sorry, Matt. I was just um, finishing once, so didn't want everybody to see me eating. <laughs> no worries. I was trying to do the same quickly, very quickly. Um, so yes, thank you all for coming back. Um, so I will also mention as we go into the COVID-19 measures before I turn it over to you, Sean, um, you heard a presentation this morning from uh, CDC and CMS uh, one measure in particular that uh, we will be looking at, which is uh, MUC 0044, which is uh, the vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel. It spans a series of programs within the hospital work group. So um, one thing that the rural health work group did last week, and uh, according to NQF policies, 
um, there may be some similar feedback across uh, all these different programs. And there may not be a need for the work group to revote again. Um, so if there are no objections after we vote on the first measure, uh, excuse me, the first program with, with this measure, uh, and we go to the next program, if there's no objections, if there's a unanimous decision, we can carry over those votes from program to program. Again, that's only because it's for the same measure across multiple programs. So um, there has to be unanimous vote, uh, decision, and that means no objection. So if you object, then we will have a separate vote for that specific measure in that specific program. Uh, and that objection does not require a vote. It is just saying, I, I, I would wish to vote on this separately, or I do not want to carry over the votes. All we need is just one. Again, it has to be a unanimous decision to carry over. So I want to men mention that before we get into the COVID-19 discussion, as there's a, that one measure across all of the programs. Secondly, um, you'll see that as well with the global malnutrition measure, that's MUP0032. It's used across two different programs. Um, again, if there's, a, if there's no need for the committee to feel like they want to revote uh, unanimously, we can carry over that decision to the different programs since it's the same measure in two different programs. Any questions there before we get started and um, turning it over to Sean to sort of kick us off with COVID-19 measures? And this is Marty Hatley. I, I, I can't find the raise my hand uh, <laughs> button. Sean, and I, Sean, Sean tried to help me, but I can't find it. But I do have a question. Um, the public comments on the muck list today, I don't remember seeing a link to those. Is there one that was distributed that I just missed? The, the public comments, uh, so they're, what, they're within the PAs. Um, okay. So at the very bottom of the PAs, there's a, a sort of a, a green portion. That's where yep. the public comments are in. Okay, I got it. I've got that then. Okay, I just wondered if there was something more recent than that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep, sure. And we can also resend some of them momentarily if that's helpful. And hi, Sarah, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. So to, um, I mean, I like the process that you laid out uh, because it seems more efficient. Um, and I guess, so that sort of means that any, that it m wouldn't make sense to sort of have a robust discussion on the first program, uh, or, you know, rather that people can sort of air their views on the concept of the vaccine requirement uh, measure generally. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so yes, I, I believe. I believe in, I in, 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 you know, so for example, uh, the public comment is gets it pretty much repeated um, for e each measure. I didn't notice any comments that were specific to, to, to one program, there may have been a few, but um, but I, 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 I don't want to assume, but I sort of anticipate that um, that people's opinions are gonna be their opinions no matter what the program. Yeah, Sarah, it's, it, yeah, it's Sean. Um, we, we anticipate that. And so what I anticipate is that there's going to be a rich discussion the, around the first one, um, and then hopefully a very streamlined discussion um, around all of the other, the same measure within the different programs. Um, um, and obviously, you know, if something comes up unique or somebody forgot something, we will get to that. And then um, I just wanted to also remind folks about the, how this will, will go. Um, so NQF staff, myself, will be introducing the measure going through the PA. Um, and then um, the, our co-chairs, in this case, Sean for COVID-19, will be asking for any clarifying questions, which can then be um, uh, sort of triaged either to the developer um, or um, to NQF staff. Uh, and then will, after those clarifying questions are, are resolved, uh, there will be an open for vote. And the vote is to uh, whether or not you want to accept the PA recommendation as listed in there. If we have 60% or more that accepts it, it will stand as is and we move forward to the next program. If we do not attain that 60% or more, uh, then we will need to open it up for further discussion in which our lead discussants will then go through the PAs 
uh, as well as provide any concerns that they may have and, and engage the rest of the work group in that way. And then as we, uh, as Sean and, and Akeem uh, sort of summarize some of those viewpoints, we will then open it up for a vote based on one of the decision categories. And again, we need to have 60% or more on one of those decision categories for it to move forward. If we do not, uh, then um, uh, sort of by default, it would, it would accept the PA recommendation. Hey, I had a question. Um, I don't see any public comments in the preliminary analysis documents I have. Was there one sent earlier and then another later? Um, there was one sent earlier, yes. And then we did send one late last week on Friday. Yeah, um, I think that's the one I have, but. We can certainly resend that out. So there, was, there were uh, two different uh, PAs sent out as PDFs. One was sent prior to the public comments getting put in and the other was sent yeah. out on, on Friday. And the public comments would be in the green portions. Yeah. Of, and, yeah. I see where they're supposed to be, but I'm not seeing anything. Uh, so maybe, Friday, what yeah. date was Friday? So I couldn't find them either. And um, the 11th or the 9th? I'm, no, would it be the 8th? Yeah. It, it would be, uh, yeah. So we can resend those out. Uh, so the team, the team right now will resend, resend those out. Great. That'd be you. great. Thank you so much. And it was, yep. And just to confirm, it was sent around 6 15 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Hmm. So those will be resent out. Um, are there any other questions before I turn it over to, to Sean? Right. Hi, this is Jennifer. I have a question about the voting. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes I can. Yep. Thanks. So I did my test uh, poll earlier. And so which region of the US do you call home? And that's my response is still what's on my screen. Will I need to navigate to some other point on that website or will when, when the time comes, will that just refresh and um, it, it'll direct me where to go? Yes, uh, when that time comes, it will refresh. When okay. we get to that specific question, it'll refresh for you, um, and then we'll be able to vote accordingly. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I'm uh, sorry, okay. should we go ahead and sign in on the voting already? Uh, yes, if, if you, are, um, you have not done a test, we mm -hmm. just encourage you to open up the link, uh, put your name in there, uh, and do a test just to make sure you have it up and running. Uh, this so is we, Frank, Frank Ganassi here. Others may have experienced the same thing. I don't know. But on the letter that you sent just an hour or so ago, there's a link that uh, under like number one and a link under number two and a link that says, here's a test. I did the same thing uh, that the other individual did. I went right to the test and said what part of the country I'm in. But just to try it, I tried the other link and it's, it says sort of, oh, oh, page not found. So the test link will work, right? The one that we pulled up. Yes, it, it should work. Because um, the other link did not take me to a viable page, just, just so you know. Okay. So it should be... So do you know what, uh, in what link was not working? It was just the other one, not the test link. Uh, I can tell you exactly, because uh, I just had it up. It was, uh, so when I got the email at uh, uh, 9.15, and it says to capture level of agreement, <clears throat> we're using this voting link. It's like the second little paragraph down. And when I click on that, it doesn't go anywhere. When I go to the underneath it, it says number one, on your desktop, navigate to. If I click on that, it doesn't go anywhere. Then a little further down after number three on your letter, it says a test poll is now live. And I clicked on that one and that one worked. And that's how I test voted on that third one. The other two, I may be the only one, but the other two did not work for me. Okay. Just so you're aware, that's all. No, 
Thanks, Frank. Uh, we will try to get this resolved for you. Uh, is anybody else having issues like Frank is? How do we know if the test worked? I mean, I clicked on my region and a thing popped up saying, telling me I could create a presentation. <laughs> that, 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 that means it worked. That means it okay. worked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Awesome. Um, Good. So I'd like to, I'd like Good. to kind of move a little, move along. Frank, we'll try to get that issue resolved for you. Well, I, um, I think I'm seeing the same screen she is now. So if that works, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. No, thank you. And this is kind of why we, we try to send these links out a little ahead of time so we can try to work out all the kinks and bugs. Um, but we'll revisit this when we start getting to the voting, but it sounds like others are up and running. Again, if you haven't accessed it, please go ahead and do so. Uh, we'll continue to move forward with the meeting. So Sean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and kick us off here with the, with the COVID-19 measures. Thanks, Matt. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess good morning still on the West Coast. And thanks everybody again for joining on um, what's going to be, a, what is a long day um, on top of what's been a very long week. Um, so as they say, let's dive into the muck. Um, and we're gonna start with um, the COVID measures. And just a couple of um, opening remarks. One is that there, are a lot of feelings, passions, um, decisions around vaccinations. And that's what makes the discussion we're going to have shortly about the measures and the CMS's role in having vaccinations as one of their quality metrics so important. Um, the other piece that I would say is that, as you heard earlier, CMS recognizes um, how quickly they've had to respond um, to this pandemic, and they are really looking to us um, for advice, for um, constructive criticism, and for guidance as they move forward. So um, part of our discussion is going to be focused on that. Um, let me start um, with public comment, um, not committee comment. And what I would ask um, is for public comment is that please limit um, your comments to a discussion of the measures and please limit your remarks um, to two minutes or less. And let me um, open that up for public comment. Um, raise your hand through the chat if you'd like or just put, um, put your comment into the chat and we will take it. Right now, Sean, I don't see any hands raised. Yudar, any, anybody coming through the chat? Nothing that I see. Thanks, thanks guys. And I'm gonna be a little slow, I'm afraid, because um, given the number of people, it's hard to see everybody's little screen and hands up all at once. So relying on Yudar on that um, for some of that. So um, with that being said, we're going to turn to um, the first measure and um, um, excuse that, me, is there yeah. any way someone could quickly summarize the public comments make sense of some of us didn't see it or were you looking these today you're looking for different we're looking for comments. different yeah okay for got different, it not thank you been, not that have been um already okay so I think Matt are you the one who's reviewing the um, NQF staff summary of the measure Yes, yes, I'll go through the PAs. Could I, could I ask you to do that? Sure, sure. Um, so- um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I, I think I missed the opportunity to ask for one to be separated. And it seems to me that the patient measure might require different kinds of discussions, maybe not. But um, since there's only one that involves patients and all the rest are healthcare workers, I. I think it I would like to discuss that separately. So, uh, sorry, Lisa, you're, sorry, ahead, Sean. Yeah. you're referring to MUC 0048, which is for ESRD patients. Yes, yes. Yes, that, that is currently slated to be discussed separately. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So the first 
measure is MUC 0044. And the first program that we're looking at right now is the Hospital Outpatient Quality Reporting Program. Um, so within the PA, um, we recognize uh, obviously the, the critical quality issue that lies ahead uh, with COVID-19. And then this is a new measure that's not been reviewed by the MAP work group or used by C within a CMS program. Um, this vaccination is a national healthcare priority. The hospital outpatient quality reporting program does not include any measures of vaccination for healthcare personnel or patients, which is MUC 0044 for healthcare personnel. Um, we also recognize that there is a quality challenge um, at the time of drafting the preliminary analysis, which was back in November, uh, there really wasn't any SARS uh, or the, excuse me, the COVID-19 vaccines have, that have been approved by the FDA. Um, and that existing healthcare personnel vaccination measures demonstrate variation in performance across facilities. And since this hasn't been approved, sort of thinking about the opportunity for improvement was, this, you know, there was, it was zero. So there's a large opportunity for improvement with this measure. However, even recognizing the importance behind the measure um, and the importance behind the, the quality challenge, um, the NQF um, recognized that even before any vaccine really comes to the FDA for approval or even emergency use, the vaccine must be first to be shown to be safe and effective through clinical trials. So there's definitely some evidence to show that when it comes to the FDA. And the early reports of vaccines in the development suggest that um, you know, there may be more than 90% of an of they may be more than 90% effective in the prevention of transmission of, of the virus. Uh, however, there really isn't a lot of uh, evidence currently that exists related to how uh, the measure is performing, but also um, that, uh, that emergency youth authorization is promising, but there needs to be more evidence on, on actually real world evidence and effectiveness of the vaccine. And then also thinking about the measure as well. And so with the evidence uh, decision, here, NQF staff rated that as a no, uh, just based on that fact that there still is not a lot of underlying evidence outside of just clinical trials to see how the real world effectiveness is. Um, moving down, uh, related to the efficient use of this measure across different types of programs or even resources, this measure provides really important information not currently available in the setting of, or in this, in this current setting or the level of analysis. And really it's intended for eight federal programs for non-long-term care settings. And the developer really indicates that this measure will be submitted uh, using COVID-19 modules on the NHSN website. Um, uh, however, uh, the, this vaccine will be collected uh, across seven different job categories as we saw presented uh, earlier, but also listed with that within the actual measure submission. What it really is unclear to what impact the difference in data reporting could be uh, and the data collection of these categories may have on efficiency and alignment. And, and also just the, the burden that they, this may have on providers and also these facilities as well with this measure. So it's unclear. Um, as far as feasib feasibly reported, again, that's unclear. Uh, facilities currently participating in the hospital outpatient quality reporting uh, program uh, already report on, on, on measures, uh, but it's really unclear about the reporting for this measure specifically and the mechanism of that reporting within the hospital outpatient quality reporting program. Um, same thing with specifications. Uh, so if you think about how well this, this is intended for the care setting and level of analysis and populations, the specifications aren't fully developed. So this is unclear. Um, and this uh, results in a uh, preliminary recommendation of do not support with potential for mitigation. And the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation uh, are that the evidence should be well documented and that the measure specifications should be finalized uh, following um, testing and NQF endorsement. Uh, the proposed measure represents a really promising effort to advance measurement for an evolving national pandemic and uh, the incomplete specifications require immediate mitigation and further development should continue. Uh, again, the program that we're talking about, hospital outpatient reporting, uh, this program and the needs and priorities uh, the needs and priorities listed there are making care safer, person and family engagement, best practices of healthy living, effective prevention and treatment, making care affordable, and communication and care coordination, of which this measure uh, does align with uh, a few of those, those priorities. 
Uh, I will just touch on some of the public comments that came in uh, with this measure as well. So there was some comments related to do not support for this measure, saying that the adoption of this measure was really premature and more appropriate lev levers of achieving the attended goal are sufficient for vaccination coverage of healthcare personnel. Um, and there was some discussion around how this uh, measure really differs within the clinician uh, measure. So this is the facility level measure, MUC 0044. Um, and there's some exclusions listed for the clinician measure and talking about some clarification on alignment with that measure. So that's MUC 0045, of which we're not talking about in our work group, but it is within the clinician work group. Some comments received as well around ensuring that data capture is really identical or as close as possible as what's collected with the influ influenza immunization measure. Um, so some of the programs that we are going to be talking about today have the influenza measure, um, but there's some some um, uh, discussion here around the uh, identical or harmonized type of approach to um, uh, the, the data capture with, with that measure. And it should be noted um, or should not be used for payment decisions or public reporting as there is concern that this measure will undergo substantial changes. So um, that were uh, just a high level review of the PA as well as some of the comments that were received. And these comments are very similar across all of the, uh, the programs for MUC 0044. Um, so I will stop there and Sean, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Matt, that was extremely helpful. So at this point um, in the proceedings, what we're going to do is we're gonna um, ask um, all of you if you have either clarifying questions um, for the measure developers or concerns that you'd like to um, express and we will compile those and ask CMS to um, develop or to answer those. Um, and I am going to um, try and start going down um, the list of folks who have hands. Um, also, if you could put them in the chat function, that would be also extremely helpful because um, then I can just, um, the measure developers and I can just read them off. So. Um, um, looking at my Brady Bunch screen, let me start with Anna um, at the top. Thank you. Uh, this is exciting. And I, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, thanks to CDC and CMS and NQF for facilitating the discussion at a time where we've been so reactive with decisions because of COVID-19. It's really nice to be thinking about this proactively. And then also nice to know that there's a lot of understanding of the, the uncertainty and that there's some willingness to accommodate that and be mindful of that moving forward as decisions are made. Um, you know, Dr. Bundit said that there's the nice thing about this is that this is not, there's precedent for um, measures about vaccinating healthcare work, workers, which is true. The piece that is not precedented and unprecedented, we've used that word a lot these days is novel virus, brand new vaccines, um, the pipeline is changing. We only have two out of the gate so far with another three closely behind. Um, that might change this dynamic a bit. The, the question about vaccine durability has come up with the potential for the shift in the strains, the allocation, the EUA considerations. I think those are all complexities. Be, I trust the process will work um, to work some of these things out, but they're just, they're, they yet, they remain unanswered. Um, from the health system pharmacist perspective, we've asked, we've been asking our members about this, whether or not they, they, their institutions are looking at mandatory vaccination and everyone has responded with a not yet. Um, although we, we have surveyed our members and well over 90% of them are willing to get the vaccine, will or, or have either gotten it or will get the vaccine. And so we're really pleased about that. But from, a, from a, an institution perspective, they're not there yet, um, largely because of some of the legal implications with the EUA, EUA versus a, a full BLA approval. Um, the, the comments that we received from our members related to these measures um, are, have are been brought up, but I, I do wanna just list them um, related to concerns around all the different data and information sources there's, and, and seeking um, interoperability and consistency and just ease of use. There's information, there's inventory information systems, there's state immunization registries, there's VAERS, there's, um, there's now NHSN and 
and just thinking about all these different information sources and how much of a potential burden that might be back on the provider side is something they're looking at closely. Um, there was some wanting to get some clarity around the definition of healthcare worker. And I, I see we have that thanks to the analysis and the information that's been provided, but that question came up. And then also, how do you account for those multiple locations? Um, any of these, at least at this point, are being all administered in the same location, but as we start to see mass vaccination or community pharmacy locations being opened up, how does that, how is that accounted for? So that's the um, large summary of my responses. Thank you so much. Okay, so Anna, thank you. Um, and I just, I want to preface this again. Um, there are a lot of concerns, questions, comments about vaccine and vaccine rollout. Um, the charge, unfortunately, of this committee is not to, not to create those. So what I'm going to really ask is people to really focus their comments on concerns, specifically on the, around the measures that we're focusing on today. And if there are concerns around the population, around rollout, about what people are doing, then that is a concern about, that's simply a concern of, I don't believe the measure has been specified appropriately yet, um, because we're not here to design the measure. Um, because if we, unfortunately, if we attack everything COVID, um, we're gonna be here until about nine o'clock tonight and nobody has planes to catch. So. Um, Akeen and I can keep you here until Zoom goes dead. Um, so um, Jennifer, I have you next. And I, I know there are chats going in and we're, um, I'm gonna ask um, our NQF staff just to collect all of those for our developers and we can tackle those all at once if there are questions, concerns. So Jennifer, Jennifer. Great, thanks so much. Jennifer Lemblad with Stratus Health. Um, I also put my question in, in chat, so I'll just repeat it here. So first of all, I just really commend CMS and NQF for tackling something so emergent and timely. It's really important and appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to debate it today. My question is about timing, and maybe I was just a little confused on what I heard. I think that in our joint session earlier, I understood that this would go for um, uh, fiscal year 2022. And so I'm trying to understand um, as, as I think out 18 months or so and think about what comes up um, in proposed rulemaking then. And you know, none of us, will, of course, will know the situation. But I'm just trying to understand the timing of the proposed timing for when it goes into rulemaking, even as we know the challenges for where vaccines are available right now. And so just trying, if you could, Sean, just talk a little bit about um, however the measure gets specified, what that timing will be for rollout for when it gets included in uh, public reporting and when it will then be a, a, a more publicly available measure. I would love to talk about it, but that's not my role. So I'm going to turn it over oh. to CMS and the measure developer and ask Thanks. them to talk about it if we can. Th Thank you. Thanks for the power yeah, there, yeah, Jennifer. Get I appreciate out of that. It, Sean, right? So th this, is, this is Michelle. In order for anything to go into a 2022 program, it has to be introduced into rule writing in 2021. So in this case, it would either be the IPPS or the OPPS rule, which the preliminary uh, you know, proposals are generally out sometime in the spring. By then, we would hope to have much more clear both information about the vaccines and measure specifications, which will be developed by the CDC. Um, then there is always the opportunity after public comment um, to final, the role will be finalized hmm, probably what late fall, sometimes early winter. So there's actually that entire opportunity of time to finalize the actual um, measure specifications based on the information that we get before that would be finalized with a collection period then likely starting in 2022. Now, that does not, however, obviate any collection of COVID vaccination data that may be happening in the country in either NHSN or other vehicles, okay? So I'm just talking about how it is treated in any of these programs that we're talking about. It'll be introduced in uh, role writing in the spring. We'll have the measure specifications as best as we can by then. By the time the rule is finalized, which will be late fall or winter, we will have very clear measure specifications. Um, and then the introduction into the programs would be in 2022. 
So Michelle, thank you so much. Is it then fairer to say that what this does, given the unprecedented circumstances and situation we find ourselves in, by doing this now, e even though we, we saw what the NQF assessment is, it essentially gets a foot in the door, which is the only way it can happen for fiscal year 2022? Yes, thank you. That's very well put. Without this, we would have to delay an entire year. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Jennifer. Very helpful. Mary Ellen, I have you next. Great. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everyone. Um, don't want to relitigate the whole um, specification side. I do uh, agree uh, that um, more specificity needs to go in there and, and to finalize those. But just a broader question, because it's been raised numerous times in terms of um, HHS Protect, the data that's been going in that is required and mandated under um, conditions of participation in order to um, receive data and, and hospitals have been diligently reporting and we're at you know, 96, 97%, which is great and, and great partnering with HHS on, on getting those hospitals to report. So I guess a, a clarifying question or broader intent question of tying this type of data reporting to um, accountability programs. Um, I know we're talking about OQR, but also it, we're noting it could be an IQR, which of course then um, leads down the path of um, being available for value-based purchasing, for the um, STARS program. We pull measures um, from, from IQR. And uh, so just wondering the kind of intent behind tying this to um, kind of the accountability side. Of, and Mary Ellen, you're, obvi you're obviously absolutely correct. The data that gets reported to HHS is you have numbers data, you know how you know the numbers of vaccination, for example, but you're right, we're looking at performance. And it really is a question of safety and facility safety, you know? So what is the percentage of healthcare staff within a given facility that are vaccinated? And we see that as a safety issue for patients with healthcare personnel being vaccinated as well as the staff themselves. So safety facility, and you're right, so this is, a performance measure that would um, be probably publicly reported with time. So that wouldn't happen until 2023 in all likelihood um, or even beyond. Um, I don't envision it in a payment program for quite some time. And the truth is, as Janice pointed out this morning, you know, look, if God willing, one vaccination were to work and we didn't have COVID at all in the future, we wouldn't use the measure. But for the foreseeable future, I think all of us certainly believe in the urgency of this. And in looking at the performance of organizations in getting certainly their staff vaccinated and ultimately their patients vaccinated. Thanks, Thanks. Michelle. Can, can I just follow up real quickly? I think that's then very important in terms of the exclusions and, and specifications um, when we look at the context of um, kind of surge and um, if this, we face this next year, uh, you know, a new season, then, um, you know, just the, the construct of, of um, healthcare personnel is changing in terms of, do we include the, the volunteer health corps folks? Do we include the, the traveling um, folks that have come in? Um, and just the, the surge in terms of um, someone being part of your personnel or in the um, denominator one week, and then, um, you know, it's changing quarter to quarter. Um, so to, to balance that as well, but thank you. Thank you. So I've got Janice and I've got Christy and then I've got Sarah. And for those who have put um, questions, concerns in the chat, don't worry, we will target all of those. I know Michelle is um, anxiously waiting, looking at those. Janice. Uh, Michelle, you may have uh, answered this already, but you know, if we, this is a critical issue right now. The question is, is, is it a critical issue in 2023? And if we look at pandemics, um, the answer is no. Um, it's not going to be a critical issue in 2023. And so I, I wonder, uh, and you said this when you were talking, uh, responding to Mary Ellen, is, um, it's important to get this approved now so you can use it next year. But um, if pandemic follows the course of uh, both what science is expecting and what other pandemics have done, 
2023 reporting uh, may no longer um, be as uh, sort of eminent and important as it is? Maybe, Janice. Um, I like to think that that's true, but let me see. The last pandemic of 1918 was the flu, and we are measuring flu vaccination because every year it morphs and changes, and we all need to have flu vaccination annually. We don't know what COVID will look like. It may very well follow that same course that we need COVID vaccination annually. Um, our hope is that perhaps that's not true, but um, if we speak to prior pandemic diseases, all we really have is influenza and we're still measuring it. Um, Christy. Yes, thank you um, very much. I'm kind of going back to the topic of it being used in these programs, um, you know, that the, the measures being proposed for. And it seems that it is very important in these programs, especially public reporting, but also in pay for performance, obviously, that we're looking at how hospitals, in this particular case, how hospital outpatient programs compare to one another. And so um, I certainly can, I can appreciate the specification issue, but there is another issue here, which is a testing issue. Um, for reliability and validity and the ability for these measures to actually um, identify appropriate variation across um, uh, institutions and facilities. Can you, um, Michelle or others, talk about what type of testing? Um, I, I can't imagine that too much testing has gone on since it's only been up and running for a couple of weeks. But that, to me, that's another really important part of putting these in a public reporting program is that the consumers need to be able to trust that um, they really are seeing ver the variation that may be evident in um, the reports. So testing would be something I'd be curious about. Yeah, and um, I don't know who's on the phone from CDC. I saw that Dan Pollock is on. I don't know if Dan Budnitz is, and I let them speak to testing, but really, what we have is the experience of the testing from the healthcare personnel flu vaccination. And I think that we have seen that it's very valid and very reliable across multiple settings. And that's really um, kind of the empiric evidence that, that we're going with. Yes, we have to test this particular measure also, I certainly understand that, but we do have a history of staff vaccination measures. Sarah. Um, thanks. So I wanted to, um, I guess, echo Mary Ellen's um, concern that she raised about this sort of as um, morphing, in, I guess, into a value-based, you get thing sort of performance measure. Um, I have a question and a related comment, actually maybe two related comments. So the question is whether there's any consideration of other um, measures that would address safety and particularly safety among health, uh, prof uh, health personnel. And the comment is that I, it seems to me that if this is the measure, there's a risk of it becoming the thing um, and sort of obviating the need for other, um, for other things to happen in healthcare facilities. Um, and I would point, you know, especially uh, to the need to provide healthcare workers, particularly frontline workers with PPE, um, with paid time off uh, to ensure that there are infection control protocols. Um, so SEIU represents frontline workers. We have members who die, have died because they did not get PPE. Um, we represent, I'm turning to my second point, um, I think I also think that we're, this is a process measure for sure, but the number of people who get vaccines is to some extent also an outcome measure and it's an outcome of the processes employers put in place to make the vaccination happen. We as a union have launched a massive attempt to campaign to educate our members about the need to get vaccines. 
Um, but we have also adopted as a principle that vaccines should not be mandatorily required. A lot of our members are people of co color. Some of them have relatives who are in the Tuskegee experiment. They have, there's a lot of good reasons for vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and if the, if this is the measure and there is a, 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 a need to put good numbers on the board by making vaccines mandatory or pressuring workers rather than educating them, uh, and rather than educating them in a way that is particularly responsive to the um, past that some people have experienced, um, that, would, that would be a, a, a problem. Thanks, Sarah. Marty, you found your hand. I did, Sean. Thank you for <laughs> to the village of people that gave me suggestions in the box. Um, and I'm going to ask a deja vu question. Uh, if we want to support this measure uh, as much as we can, um, is there a timing difference between conditional and do not support with potential for mitigation? Do we somehow expedite the timing of of doing whatever modifications need to be done if we go with conditional versus do not support with mitigation. I just can't remember from year to year. Uh, neither can I, so I'm gonna ask Matt. So, um, so Marty, just to, to clarify here, you're saying is there, is there any, a timing uh, constraint or a timing consideration for conditional versus do not support? Um, I, I would have to uh, turn to maybe uh, the CMS on, on this as, even if it was conditional with certain conditions um, being say NQF endorsement, I think the timing would be trying to submit it to some sort of a cycle for that endorsement. If there are a do not support with the potential for mitigation, what are those mitigation points? And those mitigation points could also be, um, uh, you know, NQF endorsement, which would then lend itself to be falling into the right cycle. But I, I'll, I'll see if Michelle, um, Dr. Schreiber, if you have any uh, comments related to timing related to either one of those uh, decision categories. No, Matt, I, I completely agree with what you said. Thank you. Um, so folks, I don't see any more hands up. So what I'm gonna quickly do is just um, run through the questions in the chat um, for Dr. Schreiber and try and target the ones that um, haven't been answered, they haven't been answered in the chat. Um, so um, let me just quickly, let me try and do that. Um, Michelle, why are long-term care workers not included? Um, long, I'm sorry, which long-term care workers? Because there are some long-term care workers, but they're over on the post-acute side. Right, I think that's what I was, I think that's the, I was gonna answer it for you, but I think this is the hospital work group. So these are the hospital yeah. measures. Uh, so we're, we're not focusing on the long-term care. Correct. Uh, Denise Morris, I think all of your questions um, were answered subsequently down by CDC. Um, and um, Jennifer, we tackled that one, sorry. Um, uh, um, Frank asked, is the underlying assumption that the hospital or program substantial control slash influence over the decision-making of um, HCP and or healthcare professionals and or patients? Um, the answer to that is yes, because of, you know, let's, let's just again, look at the analogy of flu vaccination. Um, and it went through a period of years actually, where, you know, hospitals encouraged flu vaccination, had campaigns to encourage flu vaccination. Then they kind of got stricter and stricter for a while. It was, well, if you don't get a flu vaccine, you're gonna to have to wear a mask while you're at work all the time. And then there's frankly a large majority of organizations now that mandate flu vaccination in order to work there. Um, and so I think that facilities absolutely have influence over their healthcare uh, personnel. Now, that being said to, to Sarah's and others points before, I don't know that that's an expectation right now. Of course, there's a sensitivity about people who um, have all kinds of reasons to be wary of vaccines. But I think we need to put that in light of the pandemic. What's best for the health of all of us in this country is to get people vaccinated. And I think transparent information on how organizations are performing is just something that can shine a spotlight on that. And that may not be for CMS to incentivize or to pay initially, 
Um, but it certainly is for the organizations themselves to have the opportunity to look at how they're doing um, and to take whatever steps they feel are appropriate. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Lindsay, Matt, this is to you and your team. Um, the preliminary analysis indicates no for evidence-based or an outcome measure. It is also noted that the FDA is charged with determining the effectiveness. Even though it was under an EUA, I would ask Q NQF reasoning for classification of this criteria as a no. All right, thanks, uh, Sean. Appreciate the question as well. Uh, you're right, I mean, the FDA looks at safety, but also efficacy, right? So efficacy being uh, is it doing what it's uh, supposed to do? Um, we're, we're talking about real world evidence with, with this evaluation uh, of evidence and seeing how, how well it's actually performing when it's outside of a clinical trial, right? The clinical trial being the ideal state as opposed to real world settings. Um, we also want to consider how well the measure may potentially perform as well. And so evidence to support the measure. And that being said, um, if it's an outcome measure or process measure, has, is there evidence to show association that a facility or the accountable entity can do to actually impact the outcome or the, or the measure itself, the measure score? So these are other additional elements that we're looking at with evidence. And right now, since it's so new, recognizing that there are clinical trial data to show that there may be some efficacy and safety with this, there really isn't enough for us to make the conclusion firmly that there's evidence to support the actual measure associating facility level interventions that can be shown to improve uh, vaccination rates for healthcare personnel and likewise for the patient's measure as we get into that. Um, so that's really where uh, we had to say no for that evidence uh, just because there, there's none that currently exist. Thanks, Matt, very helpful. Um, I'm just quickly, um, I think the questions around um, multiple sites of vaccines were answered. Um, there is a couple of questions um, that, um, have come up um, again um, around um, whether um, if we vote do not support with potential mitigation, is the door still open for inclusion in 2020 rulemaking once the measure specs are finalized? And just a clarifying question both to um, um, NQF staff and to um, CMS. I'll comment on that one, Sean. The answer is yes, it is still open for rulemaking even if it's do not support, although CMS doesn't ever like to do this, I think all of us recognize that this is a recommending body and the government does have the final say. Um, the questions around vaccine supply have been really nicely answered. Um, thank you, Suchita. Such, oh, sorry, it's been a long day, Suchita. Um, and then, Um, and then I think the last one um, that Elizabeth McKnight raised was the burden of simultaneously um, reporting on COVID and um, um, influenza vaccines and the burden of that. Um, I think that's probably more of a comment than a question. Well, actually, I will comment on that one because the influenza vaccine, for the most part, has been re removed out of the public reporting for most programs. Thanks, Michelle. That's very helpful. Um, and then um, last, um, let's see, Sarah has a question. Oh, there it is. Um, sorry, Sarah. Um, is it possible to say something more about what the mitigation would look like? And then Aisha, I have you as well. So I'll, I'll start about the mitigation. Um, so as, as we've indicated in the mitigation, it would be, um, in, again, when we, when we think about putting mitigations in place or even con conditional support. You're trying to clearly state what the conditions are. In this case, the, the mitigation here would be something, it would be around evidence, further developing the evidence, as well as measure specifications being finalized and ultimately moving forward for testing and endorsement is the areas of mitigation here. So um, that's what we have indicated in the PA. Um, and if the group agrees to that uh, as through the vote, that's where it will stand. Um, but if there's other types of mitigation, um, have to vote separately on what that what that would be. Thanks, Matt. Aisha, um, unless something happens, you have the privilege of having the last question or comment. Thanks. Uh, so my question was around, um, you know, if the specifications evolve during a performance year, has CMS thought about that, noting that the specifications aren't done yet, and 
um, you know, indicating that it'll sort of evolve as the science evolves, that has challenges when you're constantly changing specifications within a performance year. So how have you thought about mitigating that or what would the process for that be in calculating a rate for the full year? I mean, you're absolutely correct about that. I think that we would end up having to go forward with the measure with the specifications that get finalized. And then if um, there were changes, I would think that for the most part, they would be on an annual basis through rule writing. If something really were to be necessary as we did during the COVID pandemic in several instances, you can do interim uh, final rules with comment, but um, I think all of us like to avoid that and all of us like to avoid constant uh, specification changes. We would write this in a way that we hope it would be as broad as possible and as easy to, to do. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and Frank, there's a great um, um, issue brief um, to your question from the Kaiser um, Health Foundation around influenza vaccine. Frank asked, there's an update around regional state variability. Um, obviously, um, or maybe not obviously, we don't have this yet for COVID, um, but there's some really nice um, work that's been done around influenza and the chat is there. Um, Christy, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I was, I have a question kind of going back to the timing issue and certainly taking Michelle's um, comment to heart and, and the reality of it that, you know, we're an advisory body and, um, you know, CMS could put this measure in the program, even if we did say do not support with opportunity for mitigation. It does seem to me that um, conditional support really to a certain extent says you don't have to come back to the map where do not support if, if CMS did not put it in the program, it would almost seem to me like it would need to come back to the map um, the next year, which could mean that there would be a timing difference potentially. Um, and I guess Matt, I'm just, Matt and um, Michelle, I'm just trying to clarify in my own mind because um, conditional support is if you meet the conditions, you know, you, you, it's, it's support where do not support with mitigation still carries the do not support um, with it. So it would seem to me it would need to come back here unless CMS you know, opts for going on and putting it in the program, which they certainly can do. So I'm, I'm just trying to be sure we parse those differences. And Matt, I don't know if that's a question to you or if that's a question to CMS. Christy, I suspect this measure is going to come back in the following year, no matter what. I mean, unless we okay. absolutely are through the pandemic and don't need it, because remember, we also bring any measure with substantive changes back to okay. the map. Okay. So folks, I'm going to, I think we've thank had you. a really fantastic discussion. Um, and I really thank everybody for being so focused and um, helpful. Um, to CMS, this is really a challenge. Um, I'm going to suggest now we move to um, move to our vote. Um, and the first vote is on the acceptance of the preliminary analysis by um, the NQF staff. Um, correct, Matt, Am I, I'm getting the process right. I always hate reading that. Yeah, that's correct. That's great. So the first vote again is going to accept the preliminary analysis recommendation. So that is do not support with the potential for mitigation. Um, and again, that the mitigation uh, for this measure is prior to implementation, there would be evidence to, that would be well documented and that the measure specification should be finalized, as well as testing and NQF endorsement is what is listed within the preliminary analysis. So you're voting just yes, um, accept. Uh, pre the preliminary recommendation or no, not accept. And that poll everywhere link should be functioning now. And so uh, Chris, I'll, I'll turn it to you to sort of open this up. Thank you, Matt. Um, just a sound check, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Great. So voting is now open for MUC 20-0044 SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel for the hospital OQR program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation of do not support with potential for mitigation? Yes or no? So I have a logistical question. Mine was up on the screen a moment ago. I didn't yet vote. And now it says it's waiting for the polling to pre presentation to begin. Yeah, mine as well. I, so I didn't get to vote. <laughs> Same here. 
Um, Chris, I believe you have to click activate again. Okay, now it's back up. Okay. Yep, it's back. Oh, no, no, it went away again. <laughs> Yeah, when I oh I see it now I see it. Okay. It it went away from me again. Sorry. Yeah, it's also yeah, gone. Mine's me. gone too. Yep, mine as well. Yeah, but mine's gone as well. Saw, I never actually saw the vote window. It just said waiting, get ready. It, it flashed up for me and then disappeared before I could vote. <laughs> same. Yeah. Same. Okay. For me. Um. Carolee or Becky, do you recommend I just deactivate this, clear the responses, and start over? Hi, Chris. This is Becky. Yes, let's clear the responses, and I will click the activation button uh, once you have done that. So please just let me know when you have cleared the responses. Okay. Uh, so while we're waiting for that, um, I know Linda, Linda Van Allen, are you on the call? I think I saw her. Linda will be calling in, I believe, and she may be providing her vote over the phone. But I don't see her on the call just yet. Okay, um, Becky, so I did clear the responses and then I got five more in immediately after that. So let me clear the, res they're still going now, so. The so vote again. In. Okay, so. So are you going to tell us when to revote, or are we doing that now? Yeah, so the um, votes continue to tick up here. So let me, sorry here. All right, so I'm going to um, deactivate this. Let me clear the responses. Um, and we will try this again here. So I'm clicking to activate this. Um, so let's try it again. So voting is now open for 20-0044, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel for the hospital OQR program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation, uh, which is do not support for potential for mitigation? I'm still having difficulty. Yeah, it yes. still keeps flashing away once yes. it goes up and then goes away. <laughs> I just voted. Not sure. Maybe okay. I was quick. <laughs> it is showing to me now. Showing now? Okay. It's working now, yeah. Yes, it is. You have to, you have to do it fairly quickly. It kind of goes away fast. Fairly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the Gopher arcade game, right? You have to hit the Gopher really quick before it goes back. To the okay, and do I need to check if Linda Van Allen is on the phone for uh, providing a a verbal vote at this point, or are we still expecting her later? She may be coming in a little bit. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have 24 results. Let me show the responses here. All right, so voting is closed. The results are 20 yes and four no. The work group uh, confirms uh, do not support for potential for mitigation or MUC 20-0044. SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel for the hospital OQR program. Thank you, folks. And even I'm math challenged, but know that that gets above a 60%. Um, so Matt, my understanding is now that we can ask that these that vote continue down all of the um, MUC 44 measures. Is that right? Uh, no, uh, we'll at least open it up for some discussion and questions for the programs. But um, if there aren't, I would encourage if there's nothing new um, that we move right along. And um, if and if there is an objection, then we'll hold a vote uh, for uh, for that specific pro uh, program. If there's no objection, it's a unanimous decision. Uh, we will carry over the votes for each one of the programs, and that's just specifically for Mux Zero. Zero four four. Yep. Um, so we're down. We're onto the hospital IQR program, the hospital inpatient quality reporting program. Um, just to ask if there are 
new comments, new specific comments or objections to um, moving forward? Let me just start with new comments. And as you're waiting for those, um, Sean, I'll just state as well that for this measure within this program, it also has a do not support uh, with potential for mitigation, just so we have that on record. Uh, and the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation are that the evidence should be well documented, that the measure specification should be finalized and followed by testing and NQF endorsement. Matt, can we move to the next program then? So no objections? Didn't see any. Um, where are we? Um, yeah. Healthcare. Yep. Okay. Um, so this is, we're into ambulatory surgery. Um, again, let me just ask if there's specific comments, questions that have not, not come up again. And also for this measure um, within this program, it's also do not support with potential mitigation and the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation are that the evidence and the measure specification should be finalized, followed by testing and NQF endorsement. And any objections to moving on? Matt, um, can we go to um, the um, inpatient psychiatric facility? I think that one's next, right? Uh, that is next. Um, um, new comments, questions, concerns? And for this measure in, in this program, again, do not support with potential for mitigation. Mitigation points are prior to implementation, that the evidence should be documented, that the measure specification should be finalized, followed by testing and NQF endorsement. So, um, any objections? Okay, um, Matt, the PPS exempt cancer hospitals. Um, again, new comments, questions, concerns? And the preliminary recommendation for this, do not support with potential for mitigation and the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation that the evidence should be well documented, that the measure specification should be finalized, followed by testing. In um, and any objections? Oh, Okay, um, now we, I, this is where I get to turn things over to Akeen, right, Matt? Uh, just yet, yeah, uh, we still have two more COVID, COVID measures. Oh, we have. not quite. Yeah, not, not quite, quite. <laughs> getting a little excited. Um, right, Sean, so the, the next measure, um, was well, the same measure, it's MUC 0044, but for the ESRD QIP program, um, uh, again, similar um, situation with our, our review and preliminary recommendation with do not support with potential for mitigation. Uh, the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation is that the evidence should be well documented and that the measure specifications should be finalized, followed by testing and NQF endorsement. And I just want to confirm, I, I got a message from my team. I, I, I was coming in and out. Is that, do I sound okay? Am I still coming in and out? You sound pretty good, Matt. Okay, thank you. Um, again, questions, concerns, new questions, concerns? Um, any objections? Okay, next. So, so uh, now it's a different measure. Um, so the, the voting won't carry over. Uh, since it, it is a new measure. It is MUC 0048. Um, so with this measure, this is for the ESRD QIP pro, uh, program. Uh, so uh, this is the vaccination coverage for patients in end-stage renal disease. So as previous was uh, vaccination coverage for healthcare workers. Um, so with MUC 0048, this is a new measure that has not been um, reviewed by the MAP work previously, nor within a CMS program. Um, we, again, recognize that uh, this is a national health care priority. Um, I think um, there's no measures addressing vaccination coverage within the ESRD uh, QIP set. 
Um, we also recognize that there is potential, um, this, there is a quality gap here, a quality challenge as essentially the performance on this measure as it stands is essentially zero. So there is opportunity for improvement. However, uh, again, similar to the evidence on the previous measures and what has been explained uh, previously around how uh, NQF has evaluated evidence, uh, we indicated that as a no, uh, indicating that while early evidence has been submitted to the FDA for emergency youth author authorization and it's promising, a full range of evidence is still emerging, again, thinking about the evidence to support the measure itself. Uh, and then the other areas around feasibility, still unclear related to um, how this would be re reported, if it would actually cause any uh, additional burden uh, uh, to, to report on or collect and report on. So that is still unclear, uh, as was stated previously for MUC 0044. Uh, 44. So the preliminary recommendation uh, on MUC 0048 is do not support with potential for mitigation. And the mitigation points for this measure prior to implementation, the, the specifications should be uh, specified and well documented. And the measure should be specified and finalized, followed by testing of NQF endorsement. Thank you, Matt. Um, other questions related to this measure? Um, I have a question uh, how, how it, um, it will be implemented so the facility would simply ask the patients if they've gotten vaccinated, are they going to be vaccinating, offering vaccination to patients? It's sort of hard. Is it just like a count so, uh, of who already is vaccinated? I'm not clear on that. Hi, Thank this you. is Michelle. And so yes, the facility would just be asking patients if they were vaccinated. Um, and Jesse Roach, Dr. Roach is on the phone, who is the physician lead, who, who is the actually acting chief medical officer for uh, the quality measures group, is also a nephrologist and um, the physician lead of many of the ESRD programs. So I'll ask Jesse to comment in a moment. But this is really just asking patients if they've been vaccinated. There isn't a plan at the moment, although there certainly could become one. A dialysis facility is actually giving vaccination on site. Um, this is really to ask patients. Jesse, did you want to comment? Yeah, um, I actually I don't have anything to really add other than what you had, other than what you said. I don't have anything specifically to add. Thanks. Well, I, 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 I think uh, my follow up would be what, how does it actually uh, reflect the quality of the facility? if there isn't really anything they have to do other than ask. If you get my, my question, it, it just seems very perfunctory and not necessarily a reflection of quality. Mm, I certainly understand your question, Lisa. And, and again, Jesse can comment on this again, but we know that providers have a great deal of influence on their patients. And when they recommend, for example, certain things like vaccination, we know that not every patient is going to want to comply, but we know that it certainly does help. Otherwise, why do we do smoking cessation, <laughs> you know, counseling and things like that? So we know that it does help. In the dialysis community in particular, I think that, um, you know, the dialysis patients are seen on a very routine, regular basis, several times a week within a facility. So I think that a facility does have some, um, I don't know, um, influence, shall we say, on what the patient decisions are. I suspect that it may happen in the future that dialysis facilities will actually be able to give vaccine. I'd also like to point out how important we think it is to give patients uh, in a dialysis facility the vaccine. They're some of the highest risk population um, that we have. Their mortality rates have actually been quite high. And I know Jesse does have the data on that and, and can certainly comment. So, so just as a follow-up, uh, the assumption is that they might ask once and find that 50% of the people are not vaccinated, just say. And then they ask in the next quarter again and find that 40% or 60% are vaccinated. Is, is that sort of the theory that you'll see a, a change in what the patients do based on what the facility has asked them? 
We think that that's true. And actually, we see that in measures all the time. They start low, something happens, an intervention, and you're encouraging people, you're counseling people, or what have you, and it improves. And I do think it will be, um, this will also change significantly as the back as the facilities start giving vaccines, which they're in sort of discussions with the CDC to do. So this is something I think that's evolving right now. Hey, Jesse, there's a question on the chat. Does this include home dialysis patients as well or just the facility? I'm home, everyone. Everyone. Thanks, Jesse. Um, People, are they, are you, everybody okay if we um, just, if we close and move to a vote? I'm just, um, don't want to cut off discussion, but also unconscious of keeping us on our timeline as well. Sean, it's Michelle. Can I just make one other comment? Because there have been a few questions. For example, why are you doing patients in end-stage renal disease and you're not doing them in the nursing home or we don't have it in the hospital or something like that? And the reason um, is that number one, these are very high risk patients. It's felt that this is um, a reasonable circumstance. They're still ambulatory. In the hospital, there was FDA discussion about whether or not um, we actually want to give vaccination to hospitalized patients because of their immune uh, level and the immune, uh, immunogenesis of this. So we specifically did not do hospitals. And quite frankly, we would have done nursing home facilities, except there's an underlying issue of um, the authority to get that data. So it was looking at specific settings, um, determining the highest risk of the patients, and then um, the authority that we have for data collection and whether or not we actually could influence the patients. Um, Jackson, I see you have a comment. Um, Lisa, I'm just gonna respond to yours in the chat. Yeah, just real briefly, I agree with Dr. Roach and uh, Dr. Uh, Schreiber on this one, uh, but I do, have a concern about the numbers on the flu uh, vaccination. They were exactly what I predicted they would be for dialysis facilities, meaning highest in the uh, in New England and the upper Midwest. That is a pattern that we just see across CMS quality measures, across quality programs. That's the pattern that you almost always see. And uh, I don't think we need to measure regional cultures and uh, regional subcultures any more than we already do. I'm wondering if it would make more sense to have a structural measure uh, to the effect of did the dialysis facility offer on-site vaccinations? Thank you. Um, are we okay if we move to a vote? Matt? I'm going yeah, to Sean, to you for that sounds good. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments and questions. Um, okay, Chris, I'm going to turn it to you to open up the voting platform. Okay, voting is now open for MUX 20-0048 SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage for patients in end-stage renal disease, ESRD facilities. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation of do not support with potential for mitigation? Right. I also wanna ask if Linda Van Allen is on the phone with us right now. Okay, looks like we have 23 responses in, so I will show the responses. Voting is closed. The results are 20 yes and three no. The work group does not support with mitigation, with the potential for mitigation, MUC 20-0048 SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage for patients in end-stage renal disease, ESRD facilities uh, for the ESRD QIP program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, I think with that, I now, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. It is now time for last, um, 
comments or suggestions to CMS. Um, and then we will close out this section. Did I get that right, Matt? Please tell me yes. Uh, oh, why <laughs> this is feedback. <laughs> right. So uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, recognizing that you know there's a series of measures uh, or same measure across all these programs, uh, we really wanted to engage this group on thinking about um, recommendations to CMS related to how to ensure that these measures are implementable within the programs that have been considered. So with that sort of framing, are there any other additional comments or feedback that the group has around um, how to ensure that these measures are implementable within the programs that they're being submitted for? Or any additional feedback you have? Mary Ellen, I see a hand up. Hey, yeah, um, just going back on a point that was raised earlier this morning in terms of, I believe Michelle mentioned the, uh, the concept of stratification on, on these measures and it came up with the ESRD in terms of stratifying by the facility type or if it's at home um, or whatnot. But I also have a consideration just in terms of stratification for um, the patient population for, for these measures, um, particularly um, given the um, vaccines that we currently have as being um, two doses and um, particularly for the patients that our essential hospitals treat, we're looking at social determinants of health um, and specifically transportation um, in terms of getting to that second dose um, and completing the course. Um, as being something that is out of the control uh, uh, in many cases of um, the provider. Um, and um, so just wanted to flag in terms of going beyond um, the usual stratification for duels, um, something to, to consider. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I think your hand is up too, yes? Yep. Yes, thank you. So um, I just wanted to note that I think everyone on this call is aware that critical access hospitals are not required to participate in the IQR program. And so we have 1300 plus facilities across the country re serving really important needs in rural and none of these programs will be required for them. And so just wanted to make sure that as CMS moves forward, you're contemplating how to coordinate with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and the MBQIP program um, to make sure that when we think about a measure like this, when it does get finally specified um, and it, it kind of goes through those next stages that we try to reach across as much as we can the hospital programs and that would include critical access hospitals. I don't know, Jesse, if on the rural work group you discussed that at all and certainly would welcome any additional insight, but just wanna note that important group that's missing because it's not a requirement for them. Thank you, Jennifer. Anybody else? I know there's been some chat and answers in the um, in the chat box. Going once, going twice, three so, times. Sean, Sean, Michelle, can I just make a um, a last comment from CMS's point of view? Michelle, First you're all, thank you. Of course, you can. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Um, Thank you for everybody's great thoughts and deliberations. We certainly understand that people are supportive of vaccination across the country, as NQF pointed out before. This isn't a reflection of um, lack of support for vaccination, but frankly, we offer apologies, but couldn't really do much about it that we don't have a measure that has specifications in the way that NQF is used to seeing it, or certainly any testing data. Um, we know that, we understand that, we understand the, the uh, rationale and we understand the vote. Hopefully um, we will be able to bring you a measure in the future that does have specifications and that does have testing to it. Um, but I hope that all of you understand that we were really doing this out of a sense of urgency and being proactive, that without bringing this to the map this year, it would have delayed us from doing anything for at least another year. And so um, really thank you for everybody's very important feedback. Um, and we actually apologize, we couldn't have brought you something with uh, more testing and more specifications, but I think everybody understands the reason why not. Yes, I think speaking for all of us, Michelle, yes. Um, so I'm going to um, turn things over to Matt and Akeem now. Um, 
and rest my voice. Good plan. Uh, thanks, Sean. So uh, this conversation may end up being a bit shorter uh, than the prior conversation. We're going to shift gears and talk about the end stage, end stage renal disease quality incentive program uh, and the uh, one other measure that is up for discussion with that program. So uh, let me turn it over to Matt to talk about the program and to talk about the measure. Sure. Uh, thank you, Akeen. So um, this program is a pay for performance and public reporting program. Uh, as you can see uh, listed here, the incentive structure. So as of 2012, payments for dialysis facilities were reduced. The facilities do not meet or exceed the acquired total performance score. Uh, payment reductions will be on a sliding scale, uh, which could amount to a maximum of 2% per year. And the goal is really to improve the quality of care, specifically dialysis care, produce, to produce better outcomes for the beneficiaries. Um, so I'll just talk about the measure, which is on the next slide uh, here. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, just missed uh, the public reporting, or excuse me, the uh, public comment uh, period here. So I'll just open it up uh, as well to see if there's any comments from the public. Again, you can use the chat feature um, as well as the phone. If there's any uh, comments from the public uh, related to this program, as well as uh, the measure under consideration, which will be MUC 0039 standardized hospitalization ratio for dialysis facilities. And Yudara, I'm gonna ask you, do you see any hands raised? I currently do not. I don't see any, anyone in the chat. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about the measure. We'll go to the next slide. Hearing no public comments. So uh, standardized hospitalization ratio for dialysis facilities. Uh, this is defined as the ratio of the number of hospital admissions that occur for Medicare ESRD dialysis patients treated at a particular facility to the number of hospitalizations that would be expected given the characteristics of the patients uh, seen at the dialysis facilities and the national norm for dialysis facilities. This measure can be calculated as a ratio, uh, but also can be expressed as a, as a, as a rate. It's a facility level of analysis. Um, and this is a fully specified measure. It's, been up, it's an updated version. It's actually the version, um, there is a version that's currently being used within the ESRD QUIP program, but this is an updated version. Um, and um, the updates to this measure are focused on risk adjustment methods, specifically the inclusion of a preventative comorbidity adjustment, uh, the addition of Medicare Advantage patients and a Medicare Advantage indicator in the model, the risk adjustment model, updates to the parameterization of existing adjustment factors and reevaluation of interactions and an indicator for patients time spent in a skilled nursing facility. These updates um, uh, have been reviewed and also endorsed by NQF and the standing committee uh, that it, it came through. Um, and it was passed by CSAC, our consensus standards advisory committee for their review this past spring and uh, evaluation cycle. So the spring 2020. Um, and there are no other competing measures uh, uh, for this specific measure. However, uh, there are measures that um, align with this measure. There's the standardized mortality ratio for dialysis facilities and also the standardized readmission uh, ratio as well for dialysis facilities. For the uh, recent spring 2020 evaluation cycle, the developer did cite several studies that provided effective opportunities for dialysis facilities to reduce hospitalizations. Um, so with that, uh, as well as going through NQF endorsement and passing on evidence, we rated this as a yes, that there is evidence to support the measure, as well as yes, that there, um, there is a, a critical quality objective here that's being met. As well as the quality challenge, the measure developer cites that dialysis patients are admitted to the hospital frequently, spending an average of about 11.2 days in the hospital per year. Um, we're related to uh, efficient use of measurement resources. This is a facility level measure is currently implemented in the program as is the, um, in this newer version that's been updated and endorsed um, as well uh, will be implemented within the program or um, is sought to be implemented in the program. Uh, and again, it's aligned or uh, harmonized with the other two measures I mentioned, standardized mortality ratio as well as standardized readmission ratio 
um, for dialysis facilities. As far as feasibility for reporting, the measure uses data that are derived from a national ESRD data patient database and is primarily based on Crone Web facility reported clinical and administrative data. Um, the renal management information system or RENAS and the Medicare enrollment database and claims data. Um, so it uses electronic data sources and data sets. So, rank, so seeing that it is feasible. Uh, the measure is specified and tested at the facility level. Um, so it's appropriate for the level of analysis and the population of interest, so yes. Um, uh, and the developer indicates that there's no negative unintended consequences as well for this measure. So ultimately the preliminary recommendation for this measure is to support for rulemaking. Um, again, noting that it has gone through NQF endorsement with its updates to the measure, as we said previously, um, and a current measure is already used within the ESRD uh, QUIP program. But again, the updates uh, going through NQF endorsement um, bring this measure forward for the work, work group to consider. Akeen, I'll stop there and turn it back to you. Thanks, Matt. That was a very comprehensive overview of the preliminary analysis. So as we did during the previous section, uh, I'm now going to open it up uh, for clarifying con uh, questions uh, or concerns uh, from the work group. Uh, what questions do folks have? And I'll, I'll ask you, Dara, to help keep track of anybody who's raised hands. Okay, I see Jackson. Uh, go ahead. Jackson, are you on mute? I apologize. I think I hit the wrong button. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a question for Dr. Schreiber. Your slide this morning that you didn't discuss, but you flashed up for a while regarding socio-demographic status adjustments. Um, I noticed the citation at the bottom was for the uh, 2016 ASPE report, not last year's ASPE report, which seemed to uh, do an about face from uh, the 2016 report. And I was just wondering if you could cl clarify, because this to me is a measure that uh, would be appropriate for peer grouping or something of that nature. What exactly is CMS's policy on this going forward? There is certainly ongoing discussion between the you know, across CMS, across HHS, actually, regarding the ASPE report, because it did seem to uh, change from what had been done in the past and change to some degree from what NQF had had a consensus around doing. And so it's still under consideration and it may yet change again. Um, I think at the moment, you know, we haven't made certainly in, in rule writing, any changes to HRP, which is the one program that we do do um, stratification for duels. And um, I, I think that what we also spoke about this morning, that we start providing confidential feedback information on a more broad scale uh, perspective so that organizations can see how they're doing based on stratification for whatever uh, measures of uh, social determinants that we have still holds true for this case as well. I don't, this, this isn't one that we're bringing forward that in the program would be stratified. Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it isn't at this time. It's an interesting thought though. So Jackson, thank you. I do read those reports, doctor. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, the ASPE report has been a subject of intense conversation. Thanks. All right. Other clarifying questions or concerns um, from the work group? Can, can I just, I, I'm looking at, at Lisa's question about the ASPE report. So, Please. Matt or NQF, you may want to make that public to, or not public, it is public, but you might want to make it available to the members of the group that may not be as familiar with it. Certainly. Thanks, Michelle. We'll send that around. And thank you, Lisa, for asking. We'll put that in the chat. Okay. 
not hearing any other questions or seeing any, any other raised hands at the moment. I do have one clarifying question of my own, if I may. Um, so I think I understand the rationale for the inclusion of Medicare uh, Advantage patients uh, in the uh, measure, just given the growing prevalence uh, of Medicare Advantage. There, there was one comment that was uh, raised in the public comments about the extent to which the expansion of the measure to include Medicare Advantage was tested with that additional uh, population and the extent to which any um, regional variation in Medicare Advantage might be accounted for. Uh, would you or uh, Dr. Uh, Jesse be able to uh, comment on that? I'm sorry, I guess I'm not understanding the question. Can someone clarify it for me? You're looking for regional variation around this? Uh, I, was, yeah, I was double muted. I was wondering, could you repeat the question? Okay, thanks, Jesse. Sure. So as I read the public comment, um, there were some questions about how the expansion of the measure to include Medicare Advantage um, had been tested and whether there was any analysis uh, of the impact that, that any regional variation in Medicare Advantage uptake might have on measure performance. I, I think that was the crux of it. Um, I think it was um, kidney care partners who raised the concern. Oh, okay. So they didn't test for regional variation. Um, they just included the MA population in their testing, but they didn't test for regional variation. Okay. All right. Other comments or questions? All right. Seeing none, um, we're going to proceed in a fashion similar to how we did on the last round of measures. Uh, and we're going to have a vote on whether to accept uh, the preliminary recommendation uh, from NQF staff's preliminary analysis. Uh, and that recommendation is to support uh, this measure for uh, rulemaking. So let me turn it over to, um, da -da -da. let me turn it over to Matt to talk about how to do that. Sure. Sure, no worries. Um, uh, yeah, th thank you. And so that's that's correct, Keen. We're going to uh, have the committee uh, vote in a similar fashion uh, to accept uh, the preliminary recommendation or not to accept it. And so, Chris, I see you have the poll everywhere screen running. So I'll turn it over to you to uh, make that happen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, voting is now open for month 20-0039 standardized hospitalization ratio for dialysis facilities for the ESRD QIP. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work recommendation of support for rulemaking? Yes or no? And I will ask again if Linda Van Allen has joined us yet. Okay, we have 22 votes. I'll give it just another couple of seconds here. Okay, voting is closed. The results are 22 yes and zero no. The work group supports for rulemaking, MUC 20-0039, standardized hospitalization ratio for dialysis facilities for the ESRD QIP. Okay, um, that went fairly smoothly. Um, before we leave the topic of the ESRD QIP, uh, we did wanna have an opportunity to talk about uh, any gaps uh, in the program measure set. Um, and I believe the subsequent slides include a little bit inform more information on what measures are currently in the program. Um, so any, any thoughts on gaps uh, that ought to be addressed in this program?
Oh, I don't have any thoughts. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know I stuck the link to the ASPE report in the chat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roach. All right. Other thoughts on gaps and the current uh, program measure set? Uh, do want to make sure we have an opportunity to advise CMS on what other uh, issues it may want to begin addressing with this program that it isn't already. Yeah, Keen, I'll chime in too, just to uh, maybe provide a little bit more of a sort of, I guess, context for the measures. So in the needs and priorities document, just thinking about um, for future consideration, care coordination, safety, and patient and caregiver-centered experience of care are the priority domains that have been indicated uh, for future measure consideration. Um, so if that if that provides a little bit of assistance there, but um, thinking about where there could be some gaps along those, those priority domains or if there are other priority, potential priority domains of interest, but those are the three that are indicated in the needs and priorities document. I don't want to belabor the conversation if folks don't have um, thoughts here, but let me uh, let me offer one more opportunity uh, to talk about program uh, measure gaps and other ideas uh, for the agencies they think about this program going forward. Okay. Um, hearing none, I, I guess I would say I'm sure uh, Dr. Roach and Dr. Schreiber would welcome additional thoughts uh, on measure gaps um, outside. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed uh, Marty's raised hand. Go ahead, Marty. Akeen, I just jumped in because I wanted to do something to fill the silence. I've made this comment before, but I think, I think in general across all programs, but certainly this one, we need to be looking at opportunities there are to measure cultural obstacles to improvement. Uh, whether that's at the leadership level or some other level that when we look back at 25, I'm really speaking to the patient safety priority, 25 years of focus on patient safety. It's, it's a lack of sort of a commitment to transparency and to sharing at the, at the organizational leadership level that gets in the way of so much of the improvement work we wanna do. I, I'm not a measurement person. I don't know how to get to that. There's some really interesting work going on in, in around um, disclosure and transparency and candor. Um, but I, you know, I'll reiterate that here. I've said it probably every phone call I've been on in the last three or four years, but I hope it's helpful. Marty, Marty, if I may ask, is that is that somehow related to sort of the health literacy of of a of a health system or an organization? If you're thinking about cultural obstacles, sort of you know, the health organization being health literate to that, or is it something a little bit different? Just trying to understand a little bit more about that, if you could. I've not been on previous MAP meetings where you've mentioned this, so I apologize. So Matt, it really gets at the, the way we implement a systems approach. Um, so it's a commitment to having the resources to do quality improvement, to be sharing your lessons learned beyond your own organization. So the same things don't happen elsewhere in hospital B or um, dialysis center C or D that have happened already in dialysis center A. I mean, we just haven't gotten to the point where we are really having a culture of sharing things for a lot of reasons, a lot of, you know, social sort of vectors, liability, reputation, payment, all those things get in the way of us doing more to really improve safety. And there's a 25 year look back really happening right now at how much progress we've made on safety uh, in this country and culture is the obstacle. So when I say culture, it's, you know, it's really tied to leadership. I don't know if that's helpful, Matt. I feel like I'm, it's like a 10,000 foot explanation, but um, it is, it, it's a real problem. Uh, I, I thank you for, thank you for clar clarifying that. I see uh, Tejal has um, also commented on top of yours saying you agreed to that. So um, uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Janice. Um, I think that I would make two comments. One is, um, at speaking as a nephrologist, um, I think the 
uh, there has been um, incrementalism um, that has occurred in regards to safety. And that might be part of you know, what Marty is saying as well. Um, but I uh, believe that there's um, hope in the renal world. There's really been um, a, a dramatic uh, new program to take a look at end-stage renal disease care, to take a look at innovation, to take a look at safety. And um, there are a couple of um, uh, there are a couple of partnerships, um, federal private partnerships um, going on right now to take a look at this, as well as uh, CMMI programs looking at kidney care. And I, what I would say is that there is a role for incremental um, process measurements and quality, but we also need to take a look and say, how do we make the big leaps? Um, and I am optimistic with uh, uh, the innovation that CMS has supported um, as we take a look at uh, renal care in the future. And the question is, is how do we make that, um, how do we look at that in other programs? Great comment. All right, any other comments on this program and measure gaps and the measure that we just talked about? I just wanted to thank you for those last two comments and the ones in the chat, those were, those were very good and we'll be taking those, uh, we'll be taking those back. I think that they, I, I think the one about the culture and the one about us moving forward with bigger jumps are things that we do need to look at. And so I appreciate you bringing those to us. Wonderful. Well, this has already been a, a very, very robust conversation. Uh, and I think all of us uh, have uh, reached the point of a well-earned break. So uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break um, and plan to reconvene um, at about, uh, well, 2.47 uh, 2 now, uh, about 2.57 or so. Let's uh, plan to be back on. Uh, and we will pick back up where we left off. Thank you all. Thanks, Akeem. Hey, Matt, Michelle. Sorry, I just rejoined. When are we picking back up? Hey, Michelle, 2.57, so 10 minutes. Not to be exact. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right. Sure thing. Thank you. That means we'll be restarted by three. So I think it's smart. <laughs>
answer your court reporter. I'm back on, ready to go. Great, thanks, Charles. So I've got 257, Matt. Um, should we? Yes, we should. Yeah. Then? Just turning over on my end as well. Yeah, Sean, let's let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, uh, thank you. So first, I want to thank Akeen for getting us back on a timeline all by two minutes late. Thank you, sir. Very impressive. Well done. Um, so we are now going into um, our next set of um, programs and measures. Um, welcome back, everybody. And um, Matt, I turn it over to you at this point, I think, right? Yes, I'll, I'll talk about the program and then, Yep. right, yep. So um, right now we are looking at um, the Medicare and Medicaid promoting interoperability programs for eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals, uh, hospital measures. Um, I, before I talk about this program specifically, we're going to be looking at um, a measure here, MUC 0032. Um, so this is the Global Malnutrition Composite Score. So this measure has been submitted for this program, uh, but also for the Hospital Inpatient Quality Reporting Program. So similar like we did with the MUC 0044, the COVID-19 measure, uh, if there's no abstentions, since this measure is very similar, or it is similar, it's just submitted to different, two different programs. If there's no, if there's no objections, excuse me, uh, if there's no objections, we can carry over the vote going into the hospital and patient quality reporting program for MUC 0032, the Global Malnutrition Composite Score. But first, we'll talk about its uh, submission to this program, uh, which is a pay for reporting and public reporting program. Uh, the incentive structure for this is that eligible hospitals that fail to meet the program requirements, including meeting clinical uh, quality uh, measures requirements, receive a three-fourth reduction in the application percentage or applicable uh, percentage increase. The goals of this program are really to promote interoperability between EHRs or electronic health records and CMS data collection. Um, and as previously stated at the rural health work group, when there was a discussion around its use in this program, as well as the hospital inpatient quality reporting program, uh, CMS had shared that uh, the reason for its use in this program is just to keep the sets aligned seeing that this is an ECQM, um, again, going into this interoperability program, this measure is being submitted as an ECQM for this program. And to keep the sets aligned, it's, it's, also, it's included in this program, as well as being uh, submitted for inclusion into the inpatient quality reporting program. Sean, I'll turn it back to you for any public comment. Perfect, so let me at this point call for um, public comment um, either in the chat or by raising your hand um, if you're on the... Um on the Zoom call. Um, I don't see any um, public comment, Matt. So if um, that is the case, can I ask you to introduce the measure? Sure. Um, so this measure is a composite measure consisting of four component measures of optimal malnutrition care, focusing on adults 65 years of age and older, admitted to inpatient service who receive care appropriate to their level of malnutrition risk uh, and or malnutrition diagnosis if identified. The appropriate care for in, uh, inpatients includes to, includes to malnutrition risk screening, nutrition uh, assessment for that at risk uh, or for those at risk, and proper malnutrition severity indicated along with the corresponding nutrition care plan that recommends treatment approach. It's a facility level measure. Um, and uh, this is a composite. It has been submitted to NQF uh, for fall 2020. Um, it addresses an important topic that's not, that's not currently used within this interoperability programs. Um, and the developer suggests the implementation of this measure may lead to improvement in outcomes, such as reductions in 30-day readmissions, associated costs, and additional resource utilization. Um, as mentioned uh, previously, it consists of four components, as you can see listed, listed on the slide there. 
I'm thinking about evidence. Uh, the developer does cite uh, evidence suggesting its, its uh, association with outcomes, such as the 30 day hospital readmissions compared to those without sort of a care plan in place and malnutrition care plan. However, evidence submitted to the fall 2020 NQF endorsement process by the measure developer notes that the screening for malnutrition risk for conducting uh, nutrition assessments was indicated as a grade E or supported by level uh, uh, level four or level five evidence. So those are case reports. Additionally, the evidence for providing nutrition support, uh, supporting intervention for patients uh, identified uh, by screening and assessment uh, at risk for those at risk for malnutrition or malnourished was graded uh, a C or supported by at least one level three investigation. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the quality challenge, the developer does note that among hospitals that meet a case minimum of 20 patients and at least three reportable measures in 2019, 44.7% of hospitals were the highest performing tier, uh, tier three, 14.9% 14, 14 were in tier, tier two and 40.4% were in tier one. So you can see this variation there uh, across uh, the, uh, the rates. Um, then the Medicare and Medicaid promoting interoperability programs do not currently include any measures. Uh, with similar areas of focus for this target population. And all components are required uh, data elements within this composite measure are captured with electronic health record. Uh, and therefore the measure can be feasibly reported. The measure is also specified and tested at the hospital inpatient acute care facility level of analysis. Um, so that is uh, aligned. Um, and then that leads us to a preliminary uh, analysis recommendation from the NQF staff of conditional support for rulemaking. And the conditional support for rulemaking is recommended pending NQF endorsement. Um, so Sean, I'll, I'll stop there um, and turn it back to you. Thanks. Um, and now I think is the time if there are clarifying questions or concerns for the committee for um, the measure developers or CMS, now is the time. Jennifer. Great, thanks. Um, I think there's a really important pair of measures that we're taking a look at and really addresses something that's not well attended to. So uh, appreciate that they've come forward. Um, I think it's especially true for things like pressure injuries and wound healing, surgery recovery, those kinds of things. And while it's not addressed as part of the measure, there's probably a social determinant or social factor related here if you're thinking about food insecurity. But my question has to do with, um, trying to understand or getting some clarity around how this is a composite measure. It really, I can't tell in the specifications that were included how it comes together as a single composite. It really looks like four separate measures to me. And so I'm trying to understand what the denominator is and does that shift as, um, so it's screening for everyone. And then screening um, goes to a full born assessment if a patient is at risk. And if they're at risk, then it's about having that care plan. And so trying to understand what that looks like as a single reportable measure as a composite, is it an all or none? Or does that denominator shift over time? Is, is there an ability to understand a little bit better what the reporting of that would look like? Um, thanks, Jennifer. Could I turn that over to, do we have a measure developers or um, CMS? Can you answer Jennifer's question? So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Angel Valladares with Avalier Health. I'm not sure if the CMS team wants me to take it off, kick it off, or if they'd yeah, like to. Yeah, Angel, go right ahead. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Uh, yes, great. Fantastic question. Uh, and this may just be uh, on the timing of the, um, the submission itself, uh, but we have been working with the contractors on the measure, you know, the, the basically for the the math um, and the actual specification for the calculation of the of the score um, was something that we had, you know, we had to sort of wait for guidance from the MAT staff, and that was happening during the some of the the review. Uh, but sit the long and the short of it is that we have been able to develop a specified version of the calculation to match up with the standards required for MAT and then subsequent body testing. Um, the way that the calculation algorithm works is 
uh, the four measures are calculated uh, first independently and then a um, unadjusted average of the four performance scores provides the final score for the composite. Uh, none of the measures are provided, um, you know, a, a sort of a specific weighting. And when we tested that across, um, you know, so, sort of a number of different ways, uh, we were able to demonstrate the scorers um, sort of reliability. Uh, and then also, of course, the other thing that was important for us to understand was that having a specific score um, was indeed associated, you know, sort of doing well or not doing well on the measure, depending on your population, was still um, associated with the outcomes that we know malnutrition specifically is is used, um, you know, in terms of association studies like 30-day um, readmissions that was, was described in the opening. So again, just quickly, the, the calculation is the unadjusted average of the four scores, the hospital does have to have at least three scorable measures for them to get a score on the on the global composite score. And then it's reported out, um, you know, basically as a as a total score for um, their the period that they're reporting. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other clarifying questions, comments, concerns? Um, I had a follow up to that. Um, since each each measure is sort of conditioned on the one before it, and they have to have at least, did you say they have to have at least three of the four in order to become a measure? So if if a hospital screened people and found that no one was at risk, then they're, they would not be reported on this measure, right? Because that wouldn't trigger the other steps. Uh, yes, that is that is that is correct in theory. Um, the the however, um, one of the things that we've learned over almost ten years of of doing, um, you know, sort of the malnutrition work. I haven't been part of that entire ten year journey, but um, for the for the part at least that I've been involved is that there are a number of quality improvement opportunities. So some gaps. And one of the major gaps, for example, is, is where physicians, for example, may find a particular patient malnourished, but may, um, you know, so they may make a diagnosis, um, but they aren't coordinating with the nutrition care team in a timely enough manner where they can go in, make a, a you know, sort of a physical assessment, clinical assessment, and generate the right nutrition intervention recommendations, even if the patient you know, doesn't get some of those interventions before the discharge, they can at least receive that um, guidance. It could go to their next provider, you know, outside of the hospital, or it could even go with them or their caregiver. Uh, and that could be things like modifications to the diet, providing, you know, oral nutrition support, and other nutritional interventions like education that may be recommended in an outpatient setting after the patient is discharged. So that's a major gap, for instance, that, that we've seen. And so to that point, the four measures, while uh, thematically related, if you if you you know looking at the care process itself, what the the measures do is they sort of capture the patients that may be missing from one step to the next. So, for example, with the screening measure, if patients are um, you know screened and they're found to be at risk, um, obviously we want to make sure that the patient is assessed. Uh, but there may be patients who are assessed that were not screened. And that is a normal part of hospital protocol because many of these hospitals have a 24 to 48 hour automatic tr uh, sort of trigger, if you will, in, in some of their protocols, where if a patient is um, in the hospital for more than a day or two and they haven't been screened, the dietitians usually come in and uh, do a physical assessment anyway, because if they're there for that long, there's a very high chance that they have some sort of nutritional compromise. So they come in and do an assessment and those patients end up in measures three and four, right? If they end up diagnosed, which sometimes they are, um, but they're not in one and, you know, one and two, for example. So hopefully that, that makes sense. I was trying to sort of give you a lay of the land um, and an understanding of how we've seen in, in our collaborative of, of a few hundred hospitals across the country, 
how they've been implementing um, this workflow. Yes, that makes sense. But I'm wondering, uh, I remember there was, isn't there an exclusion for people who didn't get the initial assessment? No, the, uh, the, only, ex the only exclusions are um, for patients who were discharged uh, to hospice or left against medical advice. Um, and then the other thing that's built into the measure is um, we don't look at patients who were screened. Uh, so we don't look at the screening of patients who were screened more than 48 hours before admission, uh, as that screening would no longer be clinically valid at that point. Mike? Mike Woodruff? Sorry. Saw your hand. Just a Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, th this is an important topic and it's got a great evidence base behind it. Um, my question is, it's been in testing for a number of years now um, through the collaboratives and I, I'm just clarifying whether this um, bundle or this um, composite measure when executed well, do we have evidence that this drives um, improved outcomes, specifically this measure? Sure, I'm happy to answer that question as well. <clears throat> so we, to your point, um, we've had a, a phenomenal um, engagement and excitement around this measure's use um, in over at least the data that we've received has been has come from over 100 hospitals. We used around 50 to 60 hospitals to test the measure, um, and and the collaborative that we have itself is is of 300 hospitals around the country. They have been implementing and luckily in that process one of the things that we've been doing is working with the sites to publish on their own data um, and we do have uh, quite a number of papers that have been uh, published and some are still um, you know the timing hasn't aligned they're still under review but we have a few that were published in the last year or two and the most one of the most recent ones was published and I and I believe unfortunately it didn't come in on time when we submitted for the MUC you know, list itself, but it is part of the evidence we submitted to the, the NQF for endorsement. It's a paper that we published uh, based off um, the, a, a group of hospitals that we had all reporting data around the same time. It was about 30 hospitals that were together implementing quality improvement on this top, very topic at the exact same time. And our findings were that, um, you know, given the implementation from the process perspective, of course, they were able to close a number of gaps. We were able to show statistical significance there around screening and assessment, around capturing diagnosis, and, and obviously that ending up with more patients getting the right care they needed. And then in terms of outcomes, what we were able to showcase was uh, just sort of reinforcing what we already know in the literature, right, which is that patients who are malnourished, patients even who aren't even at that stage who are, may just be at risk, right? They were just screened, triaged, and found to have some kind of um, diet issue or, or some obvious weight loss. Um, those patients have a much higher uh, likelihood to be readmitted within 30 days and also have two to three times longer length of stay. When we uh, showcase the patients who were able to be diagnosed and provided a care plan um, over that period, we showed a, a significant decrease in readmissions. The length of stay data is a little bit different because the we didn't look at um, some factors that you would need to, we didn't have the data basically to look at some factors to be able to control for length of stay because the problem with the length of stay is, right, the sicker patients are obviously gonna be there for a longer period of time. And so you're more likely to be in the hospital for longer if you end up being seen by a dietitian and, and receive care, right? And you receive that care plan. So naturally the patients who had the care plan had a lower readmission uh, rate than those that didn't, but um, the ones who had the care plan also were in the hospital longer because they tended to be sicker than the ones that, um, you know, were, were not um, assessed as malnourished or, or diagnosed as malnourished. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer. Great, right, thanks. A, a diff different question. Um, so for this one that we're looking at, 0032, is for the interoperability program. And I think what you just described is, uh, is, is terrific and it's gonna be really helpful for critical access hospitals who are included in the interoperability program because they don't quite honestly have very many rural relevant um, ECQMs. Right. I think only two right now unless they deliver babies. And so this would be a nice addition to that mix. So my question is, 
as you were just describing the studies you've done, were there any really small rural hospitals that participated and were they able to sustain their denominators so that they would have enough cases to report so that they would have this as a reportable measure? Did, were there any yes. of the really small CAHs in your study? Yes, we had, um, I'm just looking at my documents here. We had one, two, three, four, uh, sorry, going through the whole thing. It's a very long list, five. <laughs> uh, we had about five or six critical access community hospitals. So these are very small hospitals with less than um, 100 beds. Thanks. Alisa. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, the, uh, I think this is a terrific measure also, but um, I'm struggling, to, is it, it seems to be more of a measure of helping the hospitals with readmissions and length of stay measures. And so the assumption is that if the patient is not readmitted, then somehow the, the screening for malnutrition is the reason why. And I, mm, I understand yeah. there are some studies that you have connected with that. Um, could you talk about that a little bit more? Sure, so that's a great question. Um, but just off the bat, I would say that's not the argument we're, we're suggesting, right? So what we're suggesting is that um, we, we've done some a, new, a number of studies which showcase two different things, right? I think one is what you were hinting at the, at the top right of your comment, which was that malnutrition is definitely a way to help patient, uh, hospitals, particularly um, providers, right? Understand a, a risk factor that is a significant predictor of adverse um, you know, outcomes, right? So increased readmission risk, increased length of stay, average length of stay um, at the population level. In terms, and I will also, you know, you could also say individually. Um, and so we were able to showcase that it's in the testing documentation as well. And obviously the evidence is pretty significant, especially um, internationally. I think the United States unfortunately falls behind significantly um, in terms of many of its peers at, um, in other countries studying this, there's significant evidence in Europe, in Asia, um, in you know, developed countries showcasing the, the link. In terms of what we were able to showcase with improvement, right, is that if you complete the whole process, it's not just the screening, because the screening itself, all you're doing is identifying the, you know, your, your target population, which to focus, which admittedly is a, also a problem in the States, right, which is very limited nutrition personnel, the ratio of, of sort of nutrition experts, if you will, if you want to, including registered dietitian nutritionists, is, is fairly low um, per, you know, per patient, you know, the number of patients that are, um, uh, are seen by a dietitian is, is rather high. So they have a pretty high ratio there. Uh, and I apologize, I have, of course, a phone bell, a doorbell ringing at the same time. Um, but I will just say that uh, the, the long of the short of it is that what we showcased was for those who do get that diagnosis, and then, event, you know, the care plan coordinated with the physician and the dietitian implemented that we saw those that reduction in readmission. So it's an association. Of course, we're not we're not trying to suggest that it's causal, but the the association was was very strong um, in, in our data, and we think that in the evidence uh, across the board, you will you will see that nutrition interventions, um, when applied to the right populations, have um, very uh, significant impacts uh, in, in terms of helping out patients with, in, in reducing adverse outcomes. Thank you. That's that's great. And I'm I'm assuming that that fourth component is actually a a very specific plan to that patient that will help that patient get to some community support and things like that. So the, the care plan itself is structured um, as part of the standards of care that the um, professional society, the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, which is the steward of the measure, um, dictates in its guidelines for, for standards of practice. And it includes uh, making specific recommendations around sort of the, the, comp the composition of nutrition support, right? So there are different modalities depending on um, the diagnosis and, and the, the state of the patient. And then also there's the, the education and counseling needs. And as you said, the, re the referrals to outside. And I think someone had mentioned very early in the commentary around there being an issue around food insecurity. 
And, and one of the main areas that dietitians are, are especially in our learning collaborative that are starting to implement more of is making connections with community support groups and, and making referrals so they get the patients have access and their caregivers have access to food banks and, and you know other support services like that. Thank you. Great, thank okay. you. Um, let me um, let me suggest at this point um, that we go back to um, Matt um, to talk about um, voting. The first we're going to do is a vote to um, whether to accept the um, NQF recommendation, um, and depending on that, we'll um, determine our next steps. Matt, did I get that right? Correct. Okay. So yes, thank you, Sean, for keeping us moving along. Um, I was just looking at the chat box. It doesn't look like there was anything different. I appreciate Jesse Spencer uh, comment related to the rural health work group. Uh, felt, it felt that these measures could be captured in the rural hospital setting. So thank you, Jesse, for sharing that. Um, and the stress is under. Okay. Um, so Chris, I will I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'm sorry for that inaudible uh, speech there, Charles. I was just sort of reading the, the last little little bit on the chat, but um, not, nothing, uh, nothing new there. So uh, Chris, I'll turn it to you. Okay, thank you, Matt. So voting is now open for MUC 20-0. 0032 Global Malnutrition Composite Score for the Medicare and Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Programs for Eligible Hospitals or Critical Access Hospitals. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation of conditional support for rulemaking? Yes or no? And I will ask again, do we have Linda Van Allen on the line? Okay, we have 21 results in on 22, 23. We'll give it just another few seconds. Okay, voting is closed. The results are 22 yes and one no. The work group conditionally supports for rulemaking. MUC 20-0032 Global Malnutrition Composite Score for the Medicare and Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program, programs for eligible, eligible hospitals or critical access hospitals. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me now just open it up for um, questions, comments, concern, or no, I'm sorry, not questions, comments, but um, identification of um, gaps in the program um, and get, measure gaps that CMS should consider. While you're doing that, Sean, I'm waiting for some folks to maybe chime in uh, with this program, which is very similar types of priorities uh, for the inpatient quality, uh, inpatient quality reporting program, the hospital inpatient quality reporting program, uh, which is th strengthen person and family engagement as partners in their care, promote effective communication and care coordination, promote effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease, and make care safer by reducing harm caused in the delivery of care are the priorities for future measure consideration within the measure, uh, the needs and priorities document. So can I just ask, uh, this is Jennifer again, in the comments, the public comments that were shared in the version released on Friday, a couple of different commenters uh, wrote about the documentation of the four elements being measured that documentation felt like it had the least evidence and was the least clinically relevant. The other three, the screening, the assessment, and the care plan all felt kind of strong and were supported, but there were a couple of different commenters that were about the documentation. Is, is this an appropriate time to ask about that if there's a, if there's any, if there's a, a reaction to that piece of the fee public feedback? Um, Jennifer, that would have been a little bit earlier around the questions and comments, but what I would okay. suggest is since we are um, going to do this again, uh, the hospital like you are, um, why don't you just bring it up then? Got it. Thanks. No worries. Uh, this, is, this is really, this is the time about gaps. Um, okay, let me close that out then and turn that over to Akeen who gets the... Um, Hospital IQR program. 
Okay, so the first measure uh, on this list is uh, going to look very familiar uh, to uh, all of us. Um, but I think before we launch into talking about the malnutrition composite score again, um, as well as the uh, patient reported outcome measure around hip and knee replacements, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Matt to talk about the, uh, the program itself. And then I think we're opening it up for public comment after that, right? That's correct. Uh, thanks, Akeen. So, <laughs> excuse me, the hospital uh, inpatient quality reporting program or hospital IQR is a pay for reporting and public reporting program with the in incentive structure that hospitals that do not participate or partic participate but fail to meet the re program requirements uh, receive a one fourth reduction of the applicable percentage increase in their annual payment update. And really the program goals are to um, progress towards paying providers based on the quality uh, rather than the quantity of care they, they provide uh, to consumers and beneficiaries, um, as well as providing those consumers with information about hospital quality uh, and, and to improve their care decision making. Okay, uh, Keen, I'll turn it back to you for opening up for public comment. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, are there any public comments on the IQR program and the measures we're about to talk about either via chat uh, or online? I'll ask you, Dara, to help monitor this for me. Okay. Um, I don't see any at this point, so I think I'm kicking it back over to Matt to talk a little bit about the malnutrition measure. Matt, let me ask you, should we talk about the malnutrition measure separately and then launch into the uh, hip and knee measure? They seem pretty different, so I, I may want to divide up the conversation here. Yeah, Sakina, I think that, that makes sense. Um, we'll, we'll talk about them separately. I will say that um, if you know, uh, we could carry over the votes for the global malnutrition composite from the previous measure since it's our previous program. Um, and just to touch on the measure itself, if we could go to that slide, you can see it listed here. It's the same measure that was submitted for the interoperability programs. Um, uh, the preliminary analysis is, is similar to, to that as well, um, recognizing that this is a composite measure um, and the evidence to support this, as, as was stated by the developer, they've done some studies here to associate some of the, um, the, the components of the measure to outcomes like 30-day hospital readmissions, to length, length of stay, um, um, and also uh, noting um, that this, this measure has uh, some gaps, uh, or at least there is a quality challenge here uh, that can potentially be filled. Um, there's some other evidence, again, uh, that the developer supports with this measure, specifically within the fall 2020 evaluation that is happening right now, as this measure has been submitted for fall 2020 NQF endorsement, um, where some of the um, malnutrition risks and some of the um, nutrition assessments um, provided uh, some, some evidence. There was grade E supported by level uh, four or five uh, types of evidence, as well as some of the other assessment uh, components and screening components of the measure were grade C or supported by at least a level three uh, investigation. Uh, but again, the developer has mentioned that they've done some additional studies and research with other outcomes as, as stated previously. Um, the, it's for the inpatient uh, quality reporting program, which does not inc currently include any measures in this area or with a similar focus. Uh, it can feasibly uh, be implemented or reported because it relies on electronic uh, health record data or electronic data. Um, and the measure is specified and tested at the hospital and patient acute care facility level of analysis as well. So this leading to a conditional support for rulemaking as the preliminary analysis for recommendation. And the condition, the condition here is it's recommended pe pending NQF endorsement. Back to you. So, thanks, Matt. So uh, before I open it up for additional questions from the group. And I do want to get to Jennifer's comment 
about documentation, I have a couple of things um, I wanted to get a little bit of clarity on from CMS and perhaps from the measure developer. The first is there is something unique about how ECQM reporting requirements are structured in the hospital IQR program. Um, it is a, um, there is a link between the promoting interoperability and IQR programs, uh, but um, the way the IQR program works is that hospitals select from a list of ECQMs available to them. Um, and I wanted, number one, to ask CMS whether it had any intention of changing that kind of reporting structure. The second um, is that we did see a very similar measure to this one come before the map uh, just a few years ago. Um, I am struggling a little bit to understand exactly what is different um, about this version of the measure, which as I recall, uh, the map was not terribly enthusiastic about versus this one. So I, I wonder if we could have a little more conversation about that. Um, so I'll kick it off a little bit. Um, I don't recall this from the past. I know it's been sort of on the list. I know that it's been on the list for a while and hasn't come forward before, but I don't recall that it's come to either the MAP or NQF. So Angel or some others on the CMS team may know history that, that predates me. Regarding your question on the Promoting Interoperability Program, McKean, you are correct. This would become one of the measures that an organization could choose to report is one of the measures, you know, there's a there's a slate of measures and organizations get the choice. We don't at this moment have any uh, plans of changing that. And of course, unless you tell me the AHA wants us to mandate certain ECQMs, Akeen, I'll certainly take that under advisement. But at, uh, at the moment, uh, I, I think, we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, at, at the moment, uh, we plan on uh, continuing uh, choice. I will say, though, just so that the group recalls, that we did put into roiding this year, I think it's in IPPS, but things got jumbled this year, that we are going to make public ECQM uh, data. We haven't before. Remember, that has not been something that we have posted in like Hospital Compare, and it has not been public. We do plan and we finalize that in rule writing that we will bringing, be bringing um, ECQM performance public and also we are increasing over time the time frames for reporting so right now you can in you report an ecqm for one quarter over the next several years it will increase by a quarter so the following year for two quarters the following year for three quarters and all of this was finalized in role writing so cms is putting more of a focus and spotlight on electronic quality measures and if if I may, this is uh, the developer angel. Uh, just wanted to add to Michelle's comments around the the timing um, and the history. So uh, you are right. Uh, there is a similar measure, uh, which I would actually say is a component measure that was brought to the attention of this body several years ago, and um, I think about maybe that's three or four years ago at this point. Um, originally, when we had gone to uh, map. Uh, through the muck list, we had we had presented the component measures in a slightly modified. These are slightly modified, um, but basically the component measures were presented as individual measures uh, for hospitals to report individually. Uh, and the recommendation, in fact, that we received from the committee was to consider a composite measure of the four measures. And we spent about three years or so developing this composite measure based off of those uh, that feedback, which we received both from this body and also from the endorsement committee, which told us that we should consider a composite considering um, how their, you know, the, the measures are related to each other. They're, they're, all the processes are important, but they're, they're related to each other and they would strengthen the case for pursuing this, this area of measurement if we had a more cohesive set um, that sort of, you know, brought you to a specific quality conclusion, if you will, um, at the end. So that, that's the history and, and the, the, I think the relationship between the, the one that you're probably recalling from a few years back. Thank you, that, that does help. 
um, it, I was trying to kind of string together the history of this and was having a bit of a challenge um, doing so. Uh, I want to make sure that Jennifer has the opportunity to raise the, uh, the issue, um, the prior discussion. So let me kick it over to you. Great, thank you. And thank you for helping me get my questions placed appropriately in the sequence of things. Um, so I noted in the public comments that were in the written materials that we received on Friday, uh, what I said just a, a minute ago, that um, a couple of commenters um, identified the documentation element, one of the four component parts of the composite measure as not having um, the similar strength of evidence as the other three. And that maybe explains the history that we just heard, some of that reference to it coming before the um, NQF in, in a previous iteration. So I'm wondering if Angel or anyone else can comment on that, that documentation component of the, that one of the four. I'm happy to speak on, and I, I presume you're speaking about the appropriate diagnosis of malnutrition. So uh, in fact, that measure is um, a really important piece of the puzzle and it actually plays a, quite a number of roles. Uh, and what's really, you know, I think interesting about this measure, um, of course, from my opinion and our, our opinion as an organization and as a partnership among several stakeholders is that um, malnutrition, you know, has a role across, you know, not only many units and departments and, and subpopulations of the hospital, but also from a thematic perspective, right, it's impact on outcomes like like readmissions and, and length of stay and cost and, and mortality, but also um, the fact that it is also a really important care coordination piece because the, the care provided for malnourished patients does require a number of different um, you know, folks from the care team to be involved, whether it's the nurse team, nursing team that screens the patient and, you know, it's triage at the very beginning at admission to the experts in nutrition and the, you know, registered dietitians who come in and provide the recommendations after conducting thorough assessment of the patient to ensure that they're indeed, you know, nutritionally compromised. And then the physician who, who signs off on, on the diagnosis and, ensures that the, the care plan that was designed and developed by the dietitian team moves forward. And, and importantly, from a, from a uh, transitions of care perspective, that when that diagnosis is in there and, it, and it's documented for that patient, um, the likelihood of it, it, it being part of the patient's discharge planning increases significantly um, because now that you know, they, there's a diagnosis to focus on and, and many hospitals um, you know, are, are used to implementing problem-focused discharge planning. And so sort of the number of reasons why we have that measure, it's, it's been very important for um, documenting and understanding the malnutrition rates that hospitals have. Um, and one other piece I'll just sort of plug in is the data that we've shown that our hospitals and our learning collaborative over implementation of these measures, including that measure in particular, have been able to uh, sort of in, identify more evidence level or evidence supported levels of malnutrition, which looking at claims data alone um, showcase that there is a significantly under reporting or, or significant under reporting of malnutrition nationally um, when you look simply just at claims. So, uh, you know, th those are the, I, I would say, the pillars of, of support for that specific component and, and its relationship to the rest. Hopefully that helps provide yeah. you a bit of context from, from our perspective. Yeah, Very and helpful. Jennifer, it, it's Michelle, if I could just comment for a moment. First, Angel, I love your passion for this measure, but your underlying point is absolutely correct, that there is less evidence for just documenting whatever, not just this, but in anything. You know, did you document X, Y, and Z? Did you provide education? Um, those seem to really be measures that have the um, least amount of effect, as it were, on, uh, on outcomes and care. And so it is true, CMS is moving away from those for that reason. They're kind of just like check the box things. Um, and that's why we're moving more towards outcomes. But I believe it's also why in this measure, it has been strengthened by the inclusion of several other elements. Makes sense, thank you. Great. Uh, I believe I see Janice's hand up as well. 
So uh, my comments actually follow, I think, along with the um, previous discussion. And um, I, I, first of all, I would say I, I believe that this is a very important indication um, for health and something that can um, should be uh, documented and should be worked uh, on. I, I, I always wonder when, why we do these things um, in the inpatient setting. And I would tell you that this is an ambulatory, it, it, it really belongs in the ambulatory care. I, I kind of feel like we capture people in the inpatient, so we slap on the flu, we slap on you know, the malnutrition screening, it, you know, we sort of do all these things. But if we really are thinking about how we are going to uh, affect this, um, I think that it goes um, into the ambulatory setting um, so that if we use these same markers, prior to someone needing their hip done or prior to someone needing it or whatever, that this becomes uh, a, a place for us to make a broader impact over multiple ambulatory um, uh, visits. Um, in addition, um, I think that what will happen is, is that in many cases, the process measure will be implemented through some sequence and it will be documented and uh, it will increase the cost of care. Um, but, it will, but that plan will not always have legs um, as the individual leaves the hospital unless we do connect it to the outpatient. So thanks, Janice, Michelle, again. I, I think that's an, an important um, issue. And actually, Angel and I have been texting a little bit, so I'm gonna tell you what he said because this actually is, is correct. Part of the issue of not having it in the ambulatory side is that we don't have great data standardization around this. We don't, as you all know, have the financial incentives to support nutritional care in the ambulatory side. And so that people felt like they perhaps couldn't um, do this in an ambulatory uh, side. There's lack of access to nutritional care on the ambulatory side. And I think those are all critiques of care, quite honestly, and critiques of the payment system, and maybe introducing measures like this actually would shine a spotlight on that in the ambulatory mm -hmm. setting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may, I, I have a, a, just a, an example, uh, just for, for context. Um, and this has been one of the shining, I think, uh, stories of, of the work that we've been doing in this uh, malnutrition learning collaborative and many of our hospitals who first in, became uh, members of the collaborative and began implementing the measures and, and, and making changes to, to care based off of their performance on these measures, they've actually naturally transitioned to actually reinforcing the discharge planning. So while I certainly um, understand the concern of sort of a, like you said, I love the analogy, a walk away care plan, um, I think one of the great uh, findings that we're hopefully going to be publishing on very soon um, to reinforce the evidence is the fact that um, many of these hospitals, after having a really successful time expanding their programs for identifying and treating malnutrition in, in the hospital, um, have gone on to implement uh, coordination for discharge and even beginning to do some of the legwork as you suggested, to have better nutrition care in outpatient settings. I think the challenge is that um, at you know, this time, there really isn't like a center of focus or, um, or incentive in the outpatient for um, these measures to be successful um, in, in outpatient without the, the hospital component, which is unfortunately where you know, it is probably a critique of the health system that many of these patients are first identified with malnutrition. So, so Angel, I appreciate your comments. And again, let me be very clear. It's not that I, I, I believe that it's a very, very, very uh, important uh, measure. And I do believe um, that it's one of the measures that should be, um, I, you know, food scarcity, the issue of malnutrition, all of these. The fact that it is more applicable in the ambulatory setting, but we don't have a mechanism to take care of it there, so we put it on the inpatient, is exactly my point. Um, it, it really doesn't, it doesn't fit in the inpatient. 
there, there will be some benefits. I have no doubt about it, Angel, that you'll be able to you know, give us examples of, of some people where there's benefits. But um, speaking globally, um, what we need to do is to take a look at how we identify and make available nutritional support in the outpatient, make these evaluations, because that's where this measure belongs. Yes, I, I agree that it belongs there, but I'd hate to go saying that it doesn't belong on the inpatient side because I think issues of nutrition belong, I, I was gonna say equally well, but perhaps better on the outpatient side, but certainly belong on the inpatient side when we get to issues of wound healing, when we get yeah. to issues of you know, yeah. patient recovery, I think that, that it's equal, not equally important, but it is certainly very important and valid on the inpatient side. I, Dr. Schreiber, uh, this is Sharon McCauley. I'm from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I'm Wonderful. Hey, Sharon. Hi, how are you? Uh, a senior director of strategic and quality management. And to answer Janice's uh, questions, you know, the dietitian nutritionist, which I am, registered dietitian, licensed in Illinois. And I've been on this program working uh, over the 10 years that Angel has described as our measure steward working side by side with uh, the developer. Our dietitian nutritionists are involved in all the continuum of care prior to the you know, admissions into the facility, into the hospital, working through those levels of all the pieces and parts of the components of the composite measure, making sure the transitions of care we have, as Angel has indicated, have stepped up. These uh, dietitian nutritionists across the country are doing quality improvement in all phases. They are now connecting with our long-term skilled uh, nursing facility dietitians, rehabilitation dietitians, home health, and are doing so this program that we've had, this Malnutrition Quality Improvement Initiative, has really elevated our standards of practice, which I am also um, in charge of at the Academy. And so every single level of competence to the expert moving forward through every single uh, domain of any of the other areas, we are there um, at the forefront. So this is, uh, and I understand what you're saying with the ambulatory, but it has to start uh, in the inpatient to move forward and transpire out into a huge learning uh, collaborative and then learning health system. So thank you so much. And thank you very much as well. I just wanted to confirm, were you, were you, were you uh, with the developer or work, you worked with them on the measure? Oh yes, I've worked with the developer since day one. So I'm sure, <laughs> so for well, uh, good, yeah. So uh, as the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we are the steward of this yeah, malnutrition the composite steward. measure. Yes, okay. we're the measure steward. And to um, Akeen's point, uh, we did have the four components separately in prior, and that was in 2016. I can give you my notes if you need them, but no. <laughs> uh, we'd like to move forward with this composite measure as we understand uh, that um, you know, on the table right now is conditional support for rulemaking, and we appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let me pause one more time and see if there are any other questions uh, by way of clarification or comments on this measure. Um, then let me ask Matt, um, should we just do a straight revote um, on this measure, or should we um, carry forward with the recommendation that was um, applied to the promoting interoperability program as is? Um, what do you suggest in terms of process? So we can we can just add, are there any objections to carrying over the vote from the interoperability programs? So again, that vote was the, the same conditional support uh, for rulemaking pending, uh, or at least the recommendation pending into endorsement. We can carry those votes over, or if there's an objection, we can have a separate vote on this measure for this program. So I'll turn it back to the work group. If there is an objection, or if there's none, we can carry those over. And it, you can either say it over the phone or raise your hand in the, uh, in the platform if you want to raise an objection. Right. And then I'll have Udara also monitor as well. I, I'm not sure what you're asking us. Are you asking us 
um, to allow the vote that we did 10, 20 minutes ago to carry over for this discussion or to re-vote? Uh, so to carry over, if you feel I think, the vote. I think if, you, if that was the intention, it should have been announced at the prior vote that we were voting. It should have been handled as the COVID uh, questions were that a vote would carry forward. What you're doing is now retrospectively saying your last vote um, will count. So, so I do object to that. Oh, I, I apologize, Janice. I, I thought I had mentioned this at the beginning with the previous measure. So uh, if you object, we can definitely open it up for a vote. So let's, okay. let's, let's do that. Okay, Matt, give me just a moment here and I'll pull the question up. Okay, so voting is now open for MUC 20-0032 Global Malnutrition Composite Score for the Hospital IQR Program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as a work group recommendation, which is conditional support for rulemaking, yes or no? And I will ask again if we have Linda Van Allen on the line, and if so, if she would like to share her vote with us. Okay, we have 23 results in. I'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, voting is closed. The results are 20 yes and three no. The work group conditionally supports for rulemaking MUC 20-0032 Global Malnutrition Composite Score for the Hospital IQR Program. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one more measure under consideration for the IQR program. Let me turn it over to Matt to talk about it. Great, thank you, Akeem. Okay, so now we are on MUC 0003, hospital level risk standardized patient reported outcomes following elective primary total hip and or total knee uh, arthroplasty. Um, uh, the measure will estimate a hospital level risk standardized improvement rate for pros or patient reported outcomes following elective primary THA or TKA uh, for Medicare fee for service patients 65 years in, of age and older. Substantial clinical benefit improvement will be measured by the change in score on the joint specific patient reported outcome measure or PR or PROM instruments measuring hip or knee pain and, fun and functioning. Uh, from preoperative assessment data collected between 90 to zero days before surgery uh, to the postoperative assessment data collected 270 to 365 days following surgery. So this is a facility level uh, measure. And regarding the preliminary um, analysis, well, actually, Akeen, I'll, I'll see if there's any public comment uh, for this measure. There, there are actually several comments for this measure, I think. Coming in from the public. Marty? I thought so. Maybe not. Uh, OK. I, there were public comments included in the pre preliminary analysis guide. I'm not sure that there are any new ones uh, raised today. But can I ask the NQF staff to double check? Yep, and confirming. Okay, um, so, so moving forward to the preliminary analysis. Okay. So um, the hospital IQR program currently doesn't have a measure of person family engagement related to total hip and total knee arthroplasty. However, the program does include a payment um, measure for hip and, and or knee arthroplasty and a complication rate measure following hip or knee arthroplasty. arthroplasty. Uh, the measure uh, is an endorsed patient reported outcome performance measure or PROPM uh, that passed this past spring, so this past evaluation cycle, spring 2020, um, and also went through CSAC and is, is endor has uh, endorsed as it stands currently. 
Uh, the developer also cites studies uh, with this measure that suggest that optimal clinical outcomes can be influenced by the surgeon performing the procedure and the team's efforts in the care of the patient, care coordination across provider groups and specialties, and patients' engagement in their own recovery. Uh, related to the quality challenge, the developer notes that the uh, average and distribution of hospital risk standardized improvement rates range from 6.65% to 86.84%, uh, with a median rate of 66.49%. So this was included in the most recent testing information that was submitted uh, and ultimately reviewed by Standing Committee and CSAC for endorsement. Uh, the developer further noted that the inter interquartile range for this was 54.36 to 72.51%. Uh, representing a difference of 18 percentage points. So uh, a variation that exists currently, um, and we, we uh, said that this was a, uh, a quality challenge based on these data. The measure complements existing outcome measures that are public report in the hospital compare. Um, as we mentioned previously, there's a risk standardized episode of care, um, a care payment measures, uh, NQF measure 2653, which is the average change in functional status following total knee replacement surgery. That's an existing clinician group level measure and is similar to this measure uh, as well. Uh, feasibly reported, this measure does allow hospitals to collect data using paper and electronic formats. Uh, so not all the re required data elements are electronically collected, but it is a patient reported outcome measure. Um, so collection of survey responses um, may, may potentially have burden on certain facilities. Uh, uh, but um, this, again, this measure allows to collect data both through paper or electronic formats. The measure is specified at the, and tested at the facility level of analysis at the hospital inpatient facility setting, and it's aligned with that setting that is proposed uh, to be utilized in. It is a new measure, not currently in use, and the subsequent preliminary, preliminary analysis recommendation for this measure is to support uh, full rulemaking. Keen, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so this is the opportunity for us to ask clarifying questions and raise concerns. So let me open it up to the uh, to the group. And I see one hand up. Let's start with Aisha. Thanks, Akeen. Um, so first, I just want to say thanks to CMS for testing this measure as a voluntary measure through the CJR program. I think it's a great way to have voluntary reporting to help develop the measure. That said, I just wanted, and I think it's probably from an NQF staff perspective and CMS as well, to talk a little bit about the burden of data collection. I know for our member health systems, that was a huge issue in the voluntary reporting through CJR, but I know the measure has changed and evolved over time. So uh, can you just speak to how the data elements are different than what it was collected, uh, what was collected for the voluntary reporting under CJR? And then um, if there's sort of differences in performance, whether you're collecting things electronically or on paper. And then um, my final question is just, through what reporting mechanism, if it's not electronic, is, is this information gonna be reported to CMS? Oh, it's Michelle, I'll just kick things off and I'm going to turn it over to our contractor then uh, Yale Corps. But uh, we recognize the issues of data collection with patient reported outcome measures in general and think this is an area that needs some significant improvement, whether or not it's an electronic platform, which we think ultimately it's going to have to be um, or what, because as we all want to hear the voice of the patient now, we recognize that it has been burdensome to capture it. Some places have to hire nurses to call people after the fact. Some people, you know, have to get information differently. And so this is something that is at top of mind and is being worked on. For this particular one though, I think some improvements or uh, modifications were made. And let me um, turn the specific uh, questions over to Yale. Uh, Dr. Shriver, thank you. This is Lisa Suter from Yale. Um, can people hear me on the phone? Yeah, Lisa. Great. Uh, so you are correct. The specifications that are in the CJR voluntary data collection are slightly uh, more onerous than um, the final specifications. They include collecting for hip patients both a hip-specific 
patient reported outcome survey and a general health related quality of life promise global score. Um, and for knees, it's a, it's a short form, uh, just like the hips, knee specific survey and the promise global. Um, we do use the promise global mental health score in the risk adjustment model, um, but not the physical function score. Uh, and uh, we do use some patient reported, including health literacy and clinician reported um, like uh, BMI um, that are collected with CJR. So overall, um, the, we have worked very hard with stakeholders and clinicians to reduce the number of questions to a very small number. The patient reported outcome surveys are six and seven questions each. Um, the, uh, and the measure itself will reduce the number of questions compared to the CJR data um, requirements right now. In terms of how the data will be submitted, um, CJR uh, has provided a lot of learning on that front. You noted some of the burden. We're also learning about um, different requirements for thresholds and response rates and response bias, um, which the measure takes into account. And there is an effort right now to create a strategic implementation plan with the voice of patients, hospitals, and um, electronic health record vendors that is ongoing uh, to inform the uh, CMS's strategy going forward to minimize burden. Great. Um, we have a bit of a queue of folks uh, lined up to ask questions. So let me start with Lindsay. Just good afternoon. I think I concur with uh, Aisha's comments and I think Lisa already addressed some of these, but while I think there is uh, opportunity in providing the op options and flexibility for reporting and how they capture this data, I do think if we're gonna see successful implementation in a range of digital quality measures, as this one you know, goes beyond just ECQMs, but has some digital capture opportunities. I think we have to be very specific in how it's implemented if we're going to see success. If we're going to trust the data as it's, as it's reported and gain confidence in those very important pro PMs, I think as much guidance as can be provided by the measure developer as it's implemented in these programs, I think, again, we'll just exponentially improve the trust in the data. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, let's see, I believe Tejal is next. Thank you. A um, couple of comments and a question. Um, so first, uh, I do think it's great that CMS is moving into the patient reported outcome space. And um, so I applaud the efforts on this. Um, I did notice in one of the public comments as well that in addition to the burden issue, you know, understanding the impact of doing these surveys on response rate of other surveys was a question that had come up. So I'd be curious if there's any information about that. I thought it was an important point to bring up. Um, and then you know, I did want to mention too that these surveys tend to focus on uh, changes in, you know, pain or functional status or other things. And, you know, it's also important to think about including the patient's perception of the success of the surgery. So not for this, but I just want to put that out there, um, Michelle, to you and CMS, to as something to be thinking about as you go forward in the patient reported outcome space. Um, and then the question I had was about non-response bias, which came up a bit earlier, I would just be curious to understand a little more about, I know in the detailed description it talked about there is um, an effort in there to adjust for the uh, non-response bias, but I'm, I just would like to learn a little bit more about how that is hopefully uh, minimizing uh, bias that might be occurring. Tejal, thanks for your comments. I appreciate it. Lisa, Maria, I'll turn it back to you about bias. Uh, apologies, just unmuting. Um, in terms of the the question about the digitization of the measure and the, and the burden, um, we really appreciate the feedback, um, and we'll, you know, as I said, we're continuing to to look at that. Um, in terms of the response bias, and I, I will provide a 
a short introduction and if additional detail, detail are needed, um, Katie, Dr. Katie Balistracy, who's the you know, led development of the measure is on as well. Um, the team looked at all of the data that we have um, and looked at the associations between, and what we have also are the administrative claims data behind, you know, in addition to the patient reported outcome data that allow us to determine what we're calling response, but what is really much more of a, uh, you know, a data capture because we don't actually know who the hospitals offered surveys to. So it's not a true response rate, but it does allow us to capture the entire proportion of patients that met criteria for the measure denominator. And using that, we were able to categorize patients into those that did not respond in any way or though, and those that responded but did not respond with complete data or those that responded with fully um, complete data. Um, and so the, uh, the risk response bias adjusts for significant factors that include things like social risk, um, including the ARC SES um, index and uh, race and dual eligibility are incorporated because those are all um, statistically significant associ associated with risk response bias. Um, I'm gonna pause there. If, if you want more detail, uh, Katie is probably better equipped to provide the statistical um, explanation. That's plenty, thank you. Great, um, and the one other thing I will note about your comment on um, response on other surveys, we've also seen that comment about this measure. I think the biggest concern what, that has been mentioned is the influence on, on CAPS. Um, and there is probably the opportunity since both CAPS and uh, HCAPS and this uh, data collection were included in CJR, we can look into the um, feasibility of examining response rates across those two, uh, across that measure. Um, but note that the HCAP response surveys are timed very differently than this measure. This measure is a preoperative and uh, close to a 12 month postoperative period to try and capture the full recovery period. Whereas HCAPs are, are sent out really immediately after hospitalization. And so we don't anticipate there being a huge um, influence or survey fatigue on, on those particular surveys. Um, but again, there are other surveys that, that may be affected and, and we may not know how. Thank you. All right, a uh, couple more questions in the queue. Uh, let's go to Denise. Hi, thank you. I want to echo what uh, a lot of people said before about especially using a standardized tool and format for collecting the information to improve the validity and reliability across the different centers that can that can make a, a big difference. Um, one thing I was wondering, and it was already mentioned a little bit, was about the burden assessment for patients in filling out these surveys as well as the time frame is very long, up to a year following surgery, and I'm wondering how many are lost to follow up, or what the response rates were with that second survey. Uh, Lisa, are you able to answer that? Yep, I am. I apologize. Um, it takes me a, a minute to get off the, uh, mute. Um, so the response rates in CJR are in the range of about 45 to 50% in general. Um, and that is somewhat due to the fact that CJR incentivized a threshold of 50% um, in the first year of reporting. So it's a little bit hard to evaluate what the real um, response rates are. Um, we clearly know that Increasing response rates rapidly over time is challenging for institutions. We've heard that feedback from CJR, um, but it is. A, we also have lots of experience with 
not me personally, but we have been in touch with clinicians and institutions that have had very successful collection of patient reported outcome data. Um, the most successful institutions have created, you know, integrated workflows where the data is discussed with the patient at the point of care um, and used for clinical decision making and therefore patients understand the value of the information. Um, I, I think there's a wide range of response rates, uh, certainly in the CJR data, and I think nationally, just any clinician's experience ranges uh, widely. Um, you know, certainly this is in, important information that I'm sure CMS will take into consideration in their implementation. All right. Um, there, uh, there's at least one more question in the queue and then a couple in the chat function. So let's turn to Marty's question first and then we'll handle the chat function one. So Marty. Hi, um, just as a comment, I'm really happy to see this uh, measure. Um, I'd highlight that the American College of Surgeons gave it a very enthusiastic uh, uh, thumbs up in the public comment because of the patient engagement piece of it, the feedback that they will get from patients um, um, that has potential to improve care and engagement. Um, I do have a question basically based on Denise's comment, you know, a year follow up if there is uh, patient death or incapacitation during that time, is there an opportunity for a family caregiver to respond to the survey? I don't think there is, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, that I'm actually going to pass to uh, Dr. Ballas Tracy. We certainly have been um, considering uh, patients who die and reflecting that obviously if they die that they may not be eligible in CJ. The way we manage it in CJR may be is likely to be different to how we might manage it, as you just described, allowing a, a caretaker or family member to complete the survey. Um, we do have the capacity for including um, surrogate uh, people filling out the data, but we've had very little of that in CJR. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Katie, see if she can add um, any insights into that. Yes, hi, this is this is Katie Bell, Tracy, can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. Um, uh, as, as Lisa noted, there is, uh, CJR did in its data collection model for these pro data, uh, allowed for a, a proxy response. Um, I, I think our interpretation of, of the limited use of that uh, probably didn't include doing so in the absence of, of the patient being alive, um, but certainly I, uh, we can't necessarily confirm that. Um, what I can say is that in the development of this measure, um, because we need both preoperative and postoperative scores in order to calculate uh, a numerator event, that um, indeed patients who um, were deceased prior to the postoperative period did not get included in the measure. This was a very small percentage of people, as you might imagine, um, for this measure. Um, elective surgery is one that is generally taken on by people who are perhaps um, somewhat healthier. Um, but it is, uh, it is something to look at um, um, in the future. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, we have a small handful of comments and questions in the chat function. So I'll, I'll try to read off a couple and um, my NQF colleagues, if I miss any of these, please do speak up. Uh, the first is from Jennifer Lundblad who says it's important to seek um, uh, and measure patient reported outcomes. So she's supportive, uh, but is wondering about the extent to which we're doing a good job of selecting patients who benefit from hip and knee surgeries. And uh, she was wondering, is there a companion measure for clinicians in addition to hospitals? I suppose that's a question maybe for Michelle. Trying to think if there's a companion outpatient PRO for this. Off the top of my head, I don't think so, but I don't want to give you the wrong answer too. So I might have to 
to get back to you. I will make one related comment though, and that's during the rural health uh, map, they actually had a very good comment about extending this to the ambulatory facilities because more and more of these surgeries will probably be done in ambulatory facilities, either ASCs or uh, hospital outpatient departments. And so that is something we're taking on the advisement. Michelle, was the question whether or not they had a, any outpatient PRO sort of yeah, survey? Yeah, do you know? If, is there one well, for the I mean, profession? The IC, ICH CAPS is for outpatient dialysis, so that would be one that we have. Uh, I, I, thank you, Jesse. I was talking about the hip or knee one, if there was one that... The that hip is, or knee one? Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Great. And then it looks like there are a couple of questions about mechanics from uh, Lisa McGifford, ah. um, including uh, how many follow-up surveys will be sent to patients over the year following surgery. And since there are only 25 surveys required for the measure, will the hospital, will the hospital simply cut it off when they get up to that 25 number? And Lisa, if I've mischaracterized anything you asked, uh, please do speak up. That's good, that captures it. And Akeen, Michelle, I'm just reading also from the chat. Thank you to the um, to the commenter who reminded us of our own program that there is an improvement activity in MIPS, not a not a measure, but an improvement activity in MIPS related to capturing PROs for hip and knee patients. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so and uh, sorry, and to try and respond to Lisa's questions, this is Lisa Suter. Um, so, so in terms of the, the response postoperatively, so there is only a single postoperative survey that's required, a single uh, you know, assessment preoperatively and a single time point postoperatively. Those time periods were defined with clinicians and patients. Um, and in terms of the 25 minimum, um, because uh, w we are, we, we think that providing information about response rates is important for this measure. And the response, uh, you know, the response rate is uh, accounted for in the measure. We think that most institutions will be motivated not for the bare minimum, but to um, obtain responses from as many patients as possible. I think, you know, for, for as with all pro PM, we are going to keep a close eye on how differential responses from um, different groups that may be, they have less access to care or maybe more vulnerable in different ways, um, at how that plays out, and that is part of the recommended um, measure monitoring that CMS routinely um, performs for their measures. So there's not really an opportunity to cherry pick the response to the sur surveys. Um, you know, it's it's a measure where the hospital is submitting the data back to CMS. So I cannot say that there won't be any cherry picking, but we do not believe that the design of the measure incentivizes you to collect less data from only the most responsive patients, um, given that we hope to be transparent about response rates um, so that those hospitals would be, you know, would have some uh, recognition that they were not uh, trying to survey as, as broadly as other hospitals. Thank you. And I just want to say I'm really glad to see this measure. It's been a long time coming. All right. Um, just looking at the time, it is for one, um, and we do need to uh, move towards a, uh, a vote on the preliminary recommendation and a GAPS discussion. Um, so I do want to make sure we keep us moving along. But there is 
one more um, question in the chat function from Mary Ellen Guinan about health literacy. And Mary Ellen, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit um, on your question. Are you talking about the health literacy level of the PRO was tested, or could you say a little bit sure. more there? Thanks, Keen. Yeah, I think I had just um, maybe not heard as clearly from um, Lisa Suter of, uh, you mentioned um, that testing was done or there were some adjustments made in terms of health literacy and how you're capturing that. Um, I know that's a critical component in terms of the administration of PROs um, that we've seen um, both language and um, cultural um, differences uh, in terms of response rates. Um, so the, the literacy is captured used with the SILS 2, which is a one question standardized and validated assessment of health literacy. It, it fundamentally is asking for comfort with filling out surveys and health, um, health forms. Um, and it was in the development of the hospital measure, it was literacy was significantly associated with your um, response to the surgery in terms of the pro PM outcome, the improvement rates. So um, that is captured in the um, actual risk model uh, as well as I believe it's also captured in the response uh, bias adjustment that uses inverted um, probability weights, but it's definitely in included in the actual model, risk model for the measure itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, this was a very robust uh, conversation. It's a complex measure, so um, really appreciate the opportunity to ask the clarifying questions here. Um, I think what we'll do at this stage is is to hold a vote on whether to uh, support the uh, NQF staff's uh, preliminary analysis recommendation here. So let me turn it over to Matt to talk about how to do that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Akeem, and thank you everyone for the lively discussion. Uh, again, you're voting to accept the preliminary analysis recommendation on support for rulemak rulemaking for MUC 0003, hospital level risk standardized patient reported outcomes primary total hip and or total knee arthroplasty. arthroplasty. Uh, I'll turn it to Chris to open up the voting. Thank you, Matt. Voting is now open for MUC 20-003, hospital level risk standardized patient reported outcomes following elective primary total hip and or total knee arthroplasty the hospital IQR program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation, which is support for rulemaking? Yes or no? And I will ask again if we have Linda Van Allen on the line with us. Okay. Voting is closed. The results are 18 yes and four no. The work group supports for rulemaking MUC 20-0003, hospital level risk standardized patient reported outcomes following elective primary total hip and or total knee anthroplasty for the hospital IQR program. Okay. So I believe that clears our threshold. So um, let us now turn to a conversation about um, measure gaps uh, in the IQR program. Um, any thoughts about measures that are missing from the program that would be important to capture um, or about um, any, any other aspect of the measure set in the IQR? And uh, Matt, if you wanna scroll and show us a sampling of what's in the program that may be helpful. So while all of you uh, think about uh, gaps uh, in the program, 
I, I do have sort of an, an overarching comment, um, and it's it's one that uh, was raised in the conversation about um, the PRO measure. Um, you know, I, I do think the concept that some kinds of procedures are beginning to move out of the inpatient space is an important one uh, for us to keep in mind uh, as this measure set evolves and as care uh, continues to evolve. Um, you know, I, I did note that there were some who actually called for uh, possibly measuring uh, hip and knee PROs in the ambulatory setting. Um, that certainly deserves some uh, from my perspective, uh, further exploration, though obviously the measure itself would matter a great deal um, to, to whether it would be appropriate to do that. But um, I, I think my overarching recommendation to CMS would be um, to be mindful uh, of that ongoing shift um, because there are gonna be some things that may not make as much sense to ask in the inpatient space five to 10 years down the line um, than it does now. Other... Thanks, Akeen. I think you're right. I think we will start seeing a shift of some of these um, things out of the hospital, um, especially as the sort of hospital only designation is, is something that is lifted. Yeah. Other feedback for CMS on the IQR measure set? Uh, anything else on the PRO measure? Um, that you want CMS to consider. All right, hearing none, I think we actually are just about on schedule, notwithstanding the uh, lengthy and robust conversation we've just had. So Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are at uh, the point of taking a 10 minute break. Um, so we will reconvene at 440. Uh, that sounds good. That's it. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'll reconvene at 440 p.m. Eastern. So and we'll close out the rest of the measures. Uh, so we'll come back then. So thank you all.
court reporter back on, ready to go. Thanks, Charles. It is um, 440 in the East. So um, I think we will reconvene and we are into the, um, the final stretches as it were. And we are now gonna turn to the hospital outpatient quality reporting program, which is purple. Um, and um, let me just begin by asking for um, public comment. Seeing or hearing none, Matt, can I ask you for a brief description of um, what we're going to be talking about? Sure. I'll, I'll start. I'll go on the, the program slide. Becky, if you can advance for just one more slide there. Oh, there we go. Yep. So just uh, talking about the hospital outpatient quality reporting program. Uh, so this is a pay for reporting and public reporting program with the incentive structure Hospitals uh, do not report, if they don't report data or required measures, uh, they receive a 2% reduction in the annual payment update. So the goal is here really to provide consumers uh, with quality of care information to make more informed decisions about healthcare options and establish a system for collecting and providing quality data to hospitals, providing these types of services or outpatient services, such as ED visits, emergency department visits, um, outpatient uh, surgery and radiology services. And the measure that we'll be discussing today, Becky, if you can advance to the measure slide, first measure, yep, is uh, MUC 0004, which is the appropriate treatment for ST segment elevation, a my, um, myocardial, myocardial infarction, STEMI, um, patients in emergency department. So this percentage, this is a measure of this percentage of ED visits or ED patients with a diagnosis of uh, of a STEMI who received appropriate treatment. The measure will be calculated using electronic health record data or EHR data and is intended uh, for use at the facility level. So it's so a facility level of analysis. Um, Sean, would you like me to proceed with uh, the PA assessment? Yeah, I think so. And then we'll come back to clarifying questions, Matt, if that works for you. Sure, sounds good. So as far as the preliminary uh, analysis, this measure assesses concepts that are similar to existing measures, uh, such as uh, fibr uh, fibrinolytic therapy received within 30 minutes of emergency department arrival and median time to transfer for acute coronary intervention uh, that are both within the hospital outpatient quality reporting program. Um, this measure is a process measure addressing timely treatment of ST uh, segment elevation myocardial infarction um, and the developer cites a 2013 guidelines in which primary um, PCI or, uh, or per coronary intervention uh, is the preferred treatment approach with the initiation of PCI within 120 minutes from the first medical contact uh, to or fibro fibrinolytic therapy administration occurring within 30 minutes of hospital arrival in situations where PCI is unlikely or impossible. Uh, a 2015 study was cited also by the developer that found approximately 50% of patients who were eligible for fibrinolytic therapy received it. Um, of this population, only about 30% had, admin had administration occur in accordance with the clinical practice guideline recommendations, therefore showing that there is a quality challenge here and um, a gap that needs to be filled. As far as um, efficient use of resources or measure resources, the measure does cover um, a measure focus area of two existing other measures. So there's some, um, uh, some alignment there and combines both of these treatment options uh, of fibrinolytic th therapy, as well as a, a coronary intervention, along with a third option of, of transferring patients to a PCI capable facility. It's feasible, it, it is feasible. The measure is fully specified and the developer notes that it has undergone alpha testing, phase validity testing fe and feasibility testing as well as usability testing uh, using an EHR-based um, assessment or electronic health record, uh, using electronic health, health record data. Um, with all of this, um, we did uh, uh, recommend a preliminary analysis recommendation of conditional support for rulemaking. 
And that conditional support for rulemaking is for recommending that this uh, measure be NQF endorsed. Uh, so Sean, I'll turn it back to you to see if there's any clarifying questions. Thanks, Matt. So um, questions, um, concerns from the group, um, either to the developer or to um, CMS. Anna. Thanks, and thanks, Matt, for that overview. Um, some of the comments in the public comment um, portion of the analysis that you gave to us alluded to concerns about that this was tested in just two of the large EHR vendors, and there was a request to consider testing it in additional ones. Is that something that would be worked out through the consensus development process with NQF, or is that are we too far down the stream to see it to see testing in other EHRs? So we do, at NQF, we do require a minimum of two. Um, so it, depending on what the developer would like to do with future testing, which I believe they can um, talk to, uh, I believe the developer is on the line. They are, they're planning on testing it in multiple different vendors as opposed to just two, but we do require a minimum of two. Um, hi, it's Elizabeth Dry from Yale with the developers. Um, yeah, I, at this point, there's not a plan to do more testing. Both those systems we tested and had multiple sites. Um, they were large systems. And we did it during COVID um, this past, you know, we, we were ramping it up right as COVID hit. It's, it's, um, it's, it's costly and time consuming. So we don't think that we'll learn a lot more um, from testing. When you test site by site, which is what you need to do with these measures, to really understand what it looks like to implement them. You know, you learn the specific challenges of, of those sites and current challenges include just the interoperability within, within system interoperability since there's data from the emergency department, the cath lab um, and the main EHR system. Sites are in all different stages of that because of CMS rules on interoperability that require hospitals to move towards full, um, basically fire APIs that allow them to uh, have fire formatted data that that they um, um, users who need it can access without special effort. That's going to get a lot better in the next few years across the board for hospitals' ability to just pull down the data we need for these measures, all of which is in standardized data fields. So, I don't think we're going to get more information that would change how the measure is structured. You know, we did learn things from those two sites um, that that, that um, prompted us to modify the measure a bit. Um, but I think it's straightforward to go forward from here without further testing, and it's just really costly. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, others, uh, let's see. Um, uh, our, Denise wants to know whether all the exclusions were documented electronically through extractable fields and not chart audit. I think, Elizabeth, that one's yours too again. Yeah, I'm gonna have, um, Card to card, he's gonna, can you speak to that one? Yeah, yeah, Talk so uh, all the, uh, the numerator actions, the denominator actions, as well as the exclusions are all uh, entirely based off of uh, EHR. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, there's no uh, piece of this which is chart abstracted. Thank you. Marty. Hi, <laughs> a comment uh, in the PA caught my eye. Um, the developer concerned as an as a possible uh, unintended consequences, inappropriate expedition of care. I'm, I'm, I need an example of that, and I need to know like how likely or how big a risk that is. Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously, uh, the door to balloon effort is, is sort of one of the leading efforts in uh, in cardiology and STEMI care, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, obviously we've made great progress uh, in door to balloon starting from over two hours uh, when the program started in 2005. And this is, uh, you know, an AHA mission lifeline um, and ACC collaboration. Um, and, and CMS was a big part of this as well. And then uh, times have now reduced uh, immensely and are now down to uh, 59 minutes as of uh, the last uh, iteration of NCDR in 2014. But obviously, you know, some concerns have been raised already. Uh, about door to balloon times and which sort of uh, leaks over to these other time-based uh, metrics as well, such as transfer times, et cetera, as to whether uh, that can cause any safety issues in, in patient care. And what they might be um, is essentially, you know, uh, taking patients to the lab who may not need to be taken to the lab. And that is not something that can be measured because these patients may come out without the diagnosis of STEMI because it was sort of a false positive. 
and there's no way to detect that. The other piece of it is also, um, you know, there may be an incentive for uh, physicians to use more femoral access, which is uh, more associated with bleeding. Uh, and that is something uh, that also uh, has been raised as a concern before. Uh, however, having said that, you know, over the period of time that door to balloon times have been decreasing uh, nationally, uh, there's no signal of increased mortality and uh, there's only a, sig a, a signal of benefit. Uh, so I think the evidence suggests that despite these valid concerns, uh, I think, you know, physicians are uh, on an average uh, using good judgment and, uh, you know, taking the right patients to the lab. So I think that was sort of the concern that uh, was raised. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. I did, I, sorry, I didn't give card to connect, uh, ask him to introduce himself, but he's an interventional cardiologist, so really active in the space and accountable for the timelines that we're setting. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Elizabeth uh, McKnight, you had a question. Um, if the STEMI metric is adopted as an HOPPS ECQM, would OPT and OP3 be fast-tracked for retirement or the measure sets run in parallel? I think that's a CMS question. or now they may run in parallel, but we do look at measures that are similar and retire those. So it would certainly come under conversation. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and then Jennifer wanted to know that on the abstraction question, the materials provided indicate only moderate agreement between chart abstractive data and EHR data. Are these data elements more nuanced than can be readily be pulled by the EHR? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to take that one again. It's Elizabeth. It's not so much that they're more nuanced. What we found at the sites where we did the testing is that the mapping of some of these elements um, within the site's EHR systems isn't really completely standardized yet. So again, we're pulling elements from the cath lab and the emergency department. And the, the, the interoperability within, within systems isn't really complete. They've been used to the same data model always. So it wasn't that the data, I think, and Kartik, you can, he was, Kartik was much deeper into the, you know, the conversations with these sites, but it wasn't so much that there was a problem with any of the data elements, it was just the mapping of those data elements so that the query that you use, which ultimately will be a lot easier once sites have mapped their data um, to meet CMS's and ONC's interoperability requirements, which is by January 2023, um, the, the, it was just to get grabbing those data through electronic queries was difficult. Uh, Kartik, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. So, I mean, the uh, the assessment that was done and, and uh, you know, the rightly raise uh, uh, the concern about the, the disagreements, uh, but this assessment has been done in, in the current state of the EHR and all health systems are sort of moving towards, uh, you know, with various IT advancements, including, you know, my health system and one of the health systems that we tested in beta testing here as well. Uh, so uh, we are hoping that, you know, with widespread adoption of common data models uh, and uh, fire implementation, uh, that this will uh, vastly improve. I think one of the key findings that we found, and this is based on qualitative assessments as well, was that the measure logic, uh, which was specified, was easily readable and easily uh, implementable in everybody's EHR. Uh, but obviously, they had to do um, uh, you know some extra coding because uh, you know all the data uh, sources were were not in a common data model, so they had to sort of query different databases. For instance, the times of when uh, the balloon was inflated. Uh, resides in a separate database. Uh, so those were some of the challenges which currently exist, uh, which we hope, uh, you know, will will reduce as time progresses. And plus, uh, you know, uh, if, if such a um, measure were to be implemented, that would also, you know, make all the EHR uh, providers to uh, include these elements in an easily accessible way. Thanks, folks. I've got Mike and then Akeen. Mike? Yeah, this is more of a follow-on question from Jennifer's, but um, how much new documentation or, or different documentation on the provider level had to be um, developed? In other words, not just interface, but um, di documenting differently in order to meet the specifications of the measure? Uh, none, absolutely, actually. And if it's all on the back end of extracting this data, it all currently resides even in the EHR in the, in the current state. Uh, it's just not easily accessible and the data uh, pieces don't talk to each other. So that's the barrier uh, that needs to be overcome. And uh, uh, that's an IT issue. Uh, and I think, you know, and those can be implemented at system level and there, sh there should be no change to the workflow of uh, providers at all. Great, thank you. Akeen. 
Thanks, Sean. So this builds a bit on the question that Elizabeth raised, um, and that's the overlap between this or the, the apparent overlap between this measure in OB2 and OB3. Um, I guess this may be a question more for CMS. Um, is the thought in doing this that those would indeed go away or, or in some way be deduplicated? And was the intention of having this measure put into the program to sort of introduce an ECQM into the OQR? If I'm not mistaken, this would actually be the very first uh, ECQM uh, that was actually included in the OQR. So could you talk a little bit about that? I'm chuckling to myself. And by the way, I will apologize to all of you. You may hear my dog back barking at the deer in, <laughs> in my yard. So King, yes, you can see that we are starting to introduce electronic measures into all of our programs. And I think you can also expect to continue to see that over time. So you're right about that. And the intent over time is also to deduplicate measures. So although I can't tell you what's going into rulemaking in the future, I think you can anticipate that this would be the direction that we would take. Thanks, Thank Mr. Chair. Um, last comments or clarifying questions for either the developers or for CMS. I would just add that, because um, this is a measure with them, more complex than usual numerator. Um, th this expands on OP2 and OP3 that, that you know, as um, I think it was Matt mentioned, I mean, the standard of care is PCI and the, those two measures don't include uh, PCI, a PCI-based facility. So this greatly expands the group of patients um, that, that we would be measuring for appropriate treatment for STEMI once implemented, um, adding, you know, lytics transfer to PCI facility from a non-PCI facility and PCI delivered at a PCI facility, all of those done in a timely way across the full spectrum of STEMI patients and just putting it in one EHR-based measure versus in two narrower chart abstracted measures. Thanks, Elizabeth, very much. Um, so Matt, my if I get this right, we are now going to um, vote whether we accept um, the PA um, on this measure. Um, and can you just remind us all what we're voting on? Sure, yes. Um, so you're, you're voting on um, this measure for conditional support uh, and the conditional support for rulemaking with the condition of pending NQF endorsement. So recommending that this be NQF endorsed. And I will turn it to Chris to open up the, the voting platform. Okay, and so, you, Matt. just a second yeah. here. Go ahead. Yep. And so, again, similar has, uh, that we've been voting, um, voting to accept this. We'll move it forward with that, with that preliminary recommendation. Um, and if we don't have 60% or more, then we will have uh, the work group have their own separate board vote on a decision category. Great. Thank you, Matt. So, voting is now open for MUT 20 0004, appropriate treatment for ST segment elevation my myocardial infarction patients in the emergency department for the hospital OQR program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation of conditional support for rulemaking? Yes or no? And I will ask if Linda Van Allen is on the line to please let us know so that we may cast her vote. Okay, voting is closed. The results are 19 yes and three no. The work group conditionally supports for rulemaking MUC 20-0004 appropriate treatment for ST segment elevation myocardial infarction patients in the emergency department for the hospital OQR program. Terrific, um, thanks everybody. Um, which brings us to our I believe last measure of the day, um, which is Matt, what is our last measure of the day? 
Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, yes, the last measure of the day is MUC0005, which is breast screening recall rates. And so um, this measure uh, calculates the percentage of beneficiaries with mammography or digital breast uh, uh, tomosynthesis or DBT screening studies that are followed by diagnostic mammography, DBT, ultrasound or magnetic resonance imaging or MRI of the breast in an outpatient or office setting within 45 days. Facility is at the facility level. And uh, going through the preliminary analysis, there are no other hospital um, uh, outpatient quality reporting uh, program, uh, no other measures like this in the hospital outpatient quality reporting program that really address this specifically breast screening recall. Um, the American College of Radiology recommends a recall rate of between 5% and 12% to appropriately follow up on abnormal screenings without the risk of overdosing or causing undue anxiety to patients. However, um, NQF and looking at the evidence that has been provided, the evidence for the measure, the measure is really not based on any specific clinical guideline, but is really supported by expert clinical consensus and support in the literature. Um, so we felt this was uh, fairly uh, low when thinking about evidence. And so we rated this as no for this category, as far as that is there a substantial evidence to support the measure. Um, going to the quality challenge, um, the developer did, does state that the, the mean measure performance is about 10% with a standard deviation of 6.3%, um, with a performance range of five to 12. Uh, so there is some variation seen uh, within the market. So arguing that there is a quality challenge. Um, the hospital outpatient quality reporting program, again, does not currently include any measure of breast screening recall rates or measures related to breast cancer screenings. And the data elements for this measure are available in claims and claims data for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. So electronic um, data that uh, can be easily reported. And the measure is fully specified and has completed beta testing, reliability testing, and face validity testing at the facility level. Um, and so uh, developer has provided some uh, data showing reliability scores there um, that are listed within the, in, within the PA, but we feel that um, it's appropriately specified for the intended use of this program. With that, um, we uh, provided a preliminary analysis recommendation of conditional support for rulemaking. And again, um, the condition here being recommended, recommended pending NQF endorsement of the measure. Sean, back to you. Thanks, Matt. So I will now open it up for um, questions or um, clarifying questions, um, concerns from the group to either CMS or the developers. And Denise, you move quickly with your hand. Go ahead. I did. I'm ready. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, kind of an NQF one. Is there a percentage of, uh, so they, there was a note that was about 3% that were outside of the target range that's statistically significant. Is that considered high enough to warrant a large enough performance gap? Is there any guidance from NQF regarding kind of that? So you're talking about the, the measure performance, which is 10%? The performance gap, yeah. Right, with a performance range of 5 to 12. Right, so that um, really just coming back to looking at the American College of Radiology, which recommends a recall rate of 5 to 12. Um, I mean, this, this also um, can be something that the work group should discuss, whether or not that range um, is sufficient to consider evaluating a performance gap. Um, but for the purposes of that range, there is a, a 10% um, as, as far as the average performance of 10% with a standard deviation of 6.3. Um, so it, it, it may be considered to have some variation there um, and uh, could be worthwhile to, to have um, a measure to fill that, fill that gap. And then, I, okay. oh, I'm sorry, Denise, didn't mean to cut you off. I, I could also welcome an, uh, the developer to comment on uh, their measure and their measure calculation here if, they, if they'd like to. But maybe Denise, if you wanted to go to your second question. Yeah, so there was some comments related to that there were outliers both on the below rate, so below that 5% as well as the above. And the differences tended to be rural or non-teaching hospitals in that lower 
and then the higher being more of the teaching hospitals. And I wondered if there was any analysis done on why that was and if it had to do with availability of technology. For example, some of the literature is showing that the um, DBT has lower recall rates and is that maybe not as available in some of the other centers, rural centers or not trained? Uh, and is it a technology issue or does it have to do on the other side with the types of patients being seen at some of those academic centers, such as those that had previously had surgery or biopsies that may make uh, more complicated reads? So Denise, I, I would um, ask the developer to comment on this and, and maybe comment on the performance uh, gap question as well. Do we have the developer? Yes, hi, this is Colleen McKernan from the Loon Group. I'll go ahead and jump in here. So to turn to your first question, Denise, first. Um, so I will note that more than 40% of the facilities that were in our analysis had their scores fall outside the targeted recall range. That 3% actually refers to those that are statistically different from the mean. So just to clarify, um, there were a bunch of facilities that were outside the 5 to 12 range, although not a lot as you went further out. Um, so they tend to cluster around like close to 5 and close to 12, but not, um, which made them statistically similar to the mean but they were outside of the recommended range. Um, and then the other question about the populations uh, of facilities that we see for the lower versus higher bounds. Um, so we have not performed um, a sensitivity assessment to try to determine why um, the facilities that are lower are um, rural, non-teaching and higher are teaching and urban. Um, but I think a lot of the points you made about um, at a teaching facility, there's just more kind of I don't want to say rigor, but there's just more kind of procedures that are often performed in a teaching environment. And then also access to services, I do think um, is a definite factor um, related to the lower recall rate. Um, so I, I will note, however, that we do include uh, regular mammography and DDT. So I know there is some slight, there are some slight differences in the appropriate range for those two procedures. But if a rural facility doesn't have access to DDT, they can use a regular mammography and film mammography and that is fine. Um, so I think that your feedback will be valuable as we prepare for NTF review and future next steps to determine if we're able to um, provide more input into the lower and higher population. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, you had your hand up, but I can't tell if you're there or not. Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what happened to my video. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> so um, my question spins a little bit off of where, where Denise was headed. You know, if I think about the ultimately when you have a measure you want to be able to improve on it right if there's a gap between current performance and best performance and so this is assessing outliers but outliers on either end and so i'm trying to understand from a patient perspective um having a, a breast screening recall is a, is a concerning thing right that causes stress and anxiety among patients and so i'm not sure a rate is helpful for a, from a patient perspective and then from um providers and hospitals if there's an outlier and they're too high or too low, is there an improvement strategy to be had? So again, Denise was asking a little bit about, is it about mammography technique or is it their imaging isn't good or do they not have access to the right kinds of services and support? So I'm just trying to figure out, if you could just talk a little bit about what, what do you do with a, a, a rate where you are uh, and, and you're an outlier, but it could be an outlier in either end. And so are there, are there the right incentives or are there sort of perverse incentives to try to get back in range? And I would just, uh, if I could bundle that with um, a question from Elizabeth McKnight in the chat, which was around um, how, how consumers interpret the metric and whether consumers can interpret this metric. Absolutely. So that's actually a great question. We also received it when we went to the rural health group last week. Um, and so I think from the consumer perspective, the range can be a little bit difficult to understand. Like, what does it mean if a facility is 9% versus 7%? And so from the consumer perspective, I think it's more important to think about whether the facility is in the range or outside of the range. And if they're below the range, they be, may be missing cases of cancer. If they're above it, they may be calling back too many people, um, both of which can have um, difficulties associated with them, whether it's having the cancer um, progress to a later stage 
or unnecessary stress and cost associated with um, a recall that wasn't necessary. So by having, by looking at it, are you in the five to 12% or are you outside of it? I think that that's a good way to message it to consumers so that they can understand, you know, is my facility performing about right or are there things that they could work on to get their scores in the range? And then from the facility perspective, you know, we don't, um, as um, I'll just speak from the developer's perspective, we don't, um, provide specific quality improvement recommendations. Um, we instead encourage facilities to work internally with their quality improvement officers, and then we often refer them to the Quiddy QIOs to do some more intensive uh, remediation if needed, uh, because we know that there are a number of options that are available to um, try to consider as potential ways to get them into the range. Um, so that's really outside the scope of what we've accomplished, but we have successfully referred facilities in the past to Quinn QIOs and gotten them um, back into a more kind of normal range for their scores. Thank you. And I'm going to briefly tackle Lisa's before I go to Kelly, um, which was also in the chat box, um, asking about um, does an NQF endorsement require evidence um, and wouldn't this fail if it went to the NQF committee for endorsement? Um, yes, um, NQF um, endorsement um, requires evidence. There's certain different levels of evidence for that. Um, and I think not speaking for NQF, but Matt, um, perhaps you would agree. Um, the reason this was conditional was so that it would go through NQF endorsement and the evidence would be evaluated by the appropriate scientific group. Yes, that's correct, Sean. Exactly. It. Um, just looking at the evidence again, um, noting that there is some consensus, uh, uh, consensus reports here to support uh, the measure. Uh, really the, the best suited uh, group to evaluate evidence based on their own expertise, both clinical and also methodological would be our standing committees and going, having it go through in endorsement to evaluate it. Um, so I've got Kelly, Denise, Christy, and Akeen. So Kelly, you're up first. Thanks. Um, I also had the same concern just about the evidence uh, when it's consensus. Um, and I wondered if there was any look just at the baseline um, risks of the different populations and if there was thought of uh, what the recall rate is, what percentage of those are then diagnosed with cancer? Because um, I would imagine that some places may have a higher recall rate, but if they're also diagnosing more cancer, that may be an appropriate higher recall rate. So is there any consideration for a balancing measure to make sure that that we're not missing other cancers um, or maybe looking at, you know, of those recalled, did they not end up having procedures? Um, it, was there any look for that kind of balance for this measure? That's a great question. Um, I've heard it uh, a lot before. Um, so first of all, to, target, to address the um, underlying population. Um, so that is something um, that we're, uh, we've been exploring over the past um, several months. Um, specifically trying to determine, because it is claim space, you know, we are limited to the number of data elements we can identify through claims, but we're hoping to locate um, for a future update to the measure, a way to um, adjust for patients for whom there is um, potential increased risk. So um, individuals with um, a BRCA mutation, as an example, would be a great population that we'd love to control for, um, especially when you look at the prevalence of those populations within each facility. Um, it's just, we're just limited by the data that are available in claims. Um, so probably more to come in the future um, on how we can control for that if we're able to adjust. Um, and then about for a balancing measure. Um, so right now the focus for this measure and then the larger measure set within which this measure would operate within OQR is on imaging efficiency. Um, CMS has in the past explored the development of a breast cancer detection rate measure, which was, uh, ex I was there. Um, many years ago, it was extremely difficult because of challenges um, with attribution and driven by the low, in, re, the low relative incidence of breast cancer. Um, we still think that the measure is valuable to the clinical community uh, based on the multi-stakeholder group with which we liaised um, during our beta testing efforts to gather input on the uh, validity, feasibility, and usability of the measure. Thank you. Um, Denise? Yeah, so I think piggybacking a little bit on what uh, Kelly was saying is, um, about, I think it was about 31% of survey respondents didn't um, think that this was, didn't agree that this was a strong measure or, or improved quality um, based on the survey results. And I was wondering if that had to do, again, with the fact that it was a standalone versus part of more of a global program as mentioned by the 
public commenters saying that this is only one piece of a larger uh, need for uh, you know more holistic look at screening. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so, you know, in the ideal world, we would have um, a suite of measures that would look at the recall rate and then either some sort of test that might be an intermediary between breast cancer detection and recall rate um, or even getting to a BCDR measure. Um, but today um, we're not there. So we're bringing the follow up measure as a or excuse me, the recall measure as a first uh, step to improve the care for women um, in the Medicare population, as well as for oncology care. And we're hopeful that in the future, CMS will be able to bring additional metrics that will support this. And just let me follow up that so I get um, Karen's question as well. Um, I think this is the CMS, I think, Michelle, this is probably yours, is um, CMS exploring a composite measure around um, breast cancer screening. We don't have one at the moment, that would be correct but I think this would be the first step in leading towards one. Okay. Um, I had Christy Travis with her hand up and then I, it looks like she disappeared. So I just wanna check um, Christy before yeah, I go to a- Ke Are Kelly there? asked my question. <laughs> so. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank um, Akeen, you're next. So my colleagues have already asked some very similar questions, the, one that I, the ones I, I had in mind with this. I, I guess what I would what I would reflect on with this is number one. I personally just taking my chair hat off for a minute. Um, the notion of a measure that um, has a range of ideal performance uh, does strike me as a bit tricky from a, an interpretation and usability perspective. Um, and I do take the comments around whether focusing on this specific measure as opposed to a more holistic set um, is really giving us the kind of picture that we need um, around how well these facilities are detecting uh, breast cancer, which is um, an incredibly important uh, topic to try to reflect. Um, so as I kind of look at the measure in front of us, I think what I'm struggling with is is there, are there questions that we have raised that can be answered in the course of NQF endorsement? Um, or is there something more significant underpinning this that um, we need to, to get a closer look at down the line? I, that's what I'm struggling with. I'm not sure I have a, a great recommendation along, those, along the lines of what to do about it. Well, let me so, take a stab at that. I think, you know, I see where you're going with it. I think we, you know, the, there aren't all that many good measures around radiology and certainly around mammography in particular, which is obviously of impact to many patients. Um, and so this is trying to get at, is your mammography, is your facility doing mammography really doing it appropriately? The range doesn't bother me so much. I mean, we have plenty of things that uh, have ranges for them as opposed to exact numbers. I think this really is sort of, do you have an, you know, a good practice of doing mammography in your organization? You know? So are your recall rates within what we would consider a reasonable range? Are they way too high? Are they way too low? I think that long-term, the keen, you're right that there are probably other measures to be added to this to create a composite measure, but that this is a first step in looking at um, adequacy of mammography, I guess is the way that I'm going to put it. Thanks, uh, Michelle. Colleen, did you want to add to that? So I was just going to give some history on a previous measure um, from those in OQR. Um, so CMS previously had um, OP9, which was mammography follow-up rates in the program. Uh, and it, can, it looks at, um, it was very similar, um, but the reason CMS removed it is because um, the evidence base did not align with current clinical practice. Uh, 
And so CMS has brought the measure back uh, because we have uh, worked with them to add digital breast tumor synthesis as a screening and diagnostic procedure to the measure in the denominator and numerator, respectively. And then also um, for the range specifically, uh, so the previous measure had a ceiling of 14%, um, but that did not have a lower bound. And so we just indicated that um, values close to zero um, may suggest um, that there might be missed cases of cancer. So we think the measure that we're presenting today is actually an improvement upon um, the measure that was in the program before because it does add DBT, um, so aligning with current clinical practice, and then also provides some more um, provides some clarity around that range. I understand your perspective on having a range itself, but by um, providing actual bounds that are that are from a publication, um, we feel that it's just a more precise metric than what was used before. And then finally, I'll note that um, we did increase the number of facilities that are in the range. Um, so previously, we uh, saw 20% of facilities fall outside of the window that we suggested, so near zero, scores of zero or above 14%. And now it's 40% that are um, below 5% and above 12%. So actually, with the addition of DBT, the performance gap does increase. Thank you, Colleen. Um, Last questions, comments, going once, twice. Okay, um, then let me um, turn things back over to Matt and we are going to vote to either um, to accept or reject the um, um, NQF staff's recommendation, which is Matt. Right, thanks, Sean. Uh, the recommendation again is conditional support for rulemaking. Um, that condition is a pending NQF endorsement of the measure. So I'll turn it over to Chris to open up the vote. Thank you, Matt. Voting is now open for MUC 20-0005 breast screening recall rates for the hospital OQR program. Do you vote to support the staff recommendation as the work group recommendation, which is conditional support for rulemaking? Yes or no? And if Linda Van Allen is on the line, please let us know and we will cast your vote. Voting is closed. The results are 15 yes and six no. Um, can my team just confirm what the percentages on that? Uh, with uh, with 21 voting and 15 yes, it's 71%. Uh, Excellent. So uh, the work group uh, conditionally supports for rulemaking MUC 20-0005 breast screening recall rates for the hospital OQR program. Um, so that, um, thank you everybody. That brings me um, to the gap discussion. And I think, um, let me just say that it, I heard at least one gap, which was the, the thought of a composite measure for um, breast cancer screening and cancer care. Um, so. I will put that one on the table um, and just open it up for others that people want to um, discuss. Um, Sean, a kind of broader comment about uh, the OQR. Um, and this is a, a problem that I think has always vexed this particular program, there is such variation in the sets of services that hospital outpatient departments offer that coming up with that fully representative uh, measure set that encompasses everything that you want it to encompass is a, a tall task indeed, uh, not easy at all <laughs> for our, uh, our colleagues at CMS. Uh, I would I think I would just echo some of the issues we raised earlier around the IQR and being sensitive to the, uh, the changes that are taking place in healthcare and migration of certain kinds of services to the ambulatory setting. Um, I do think there 
probably could be more measurement around patient safety issues, one of our favorite words of the day, um, reflected in the OQR measure set. Um, it will also be very interesting to see the extent to which we can implement patient reported outcomes uh, for some of the procedures that are done on an ambulatory basis. Um, again, hard to select what procedures you want to do it on uh, and what areas you want to do it on, but um, I think worth uh, some further exploration. Thanks, Akeen. I've got Jennifer and then Christy. Yeah, so in, in that spirit of what, what can you do with uh, outpatient measures that represent such a wide variation in what services and, and the scope of things that are offered, it makes me wonder if there um, is the benefit to thinking about a measure around the effective use of shared decision making, since so many of the things that occur in outpatient care are preference sensitive and they are trying to take uh, that combination of what's the clinical options in which case there are multiple clinical options and patient preference and value and bringing those together. So it'd be interesting to figure out how that, how a shared decision-making measure in OQR might fit in really well. Thanks, Jennifer and Christy. Yes, um, you know, this is a frustration that I have voiced before, but especially for the outpatient um, quality reporting program to a Keen's point, I think we need, instead of just looking at whether it's a process measure or an outcome measure, I think we need to think about what types of things are done in a hospital outpatient um, program, like diagnostics, like surgical procedures, you know, um, like emergency room, you know, like what are the major groupings of the types of, and that would help us identify the gaps. I, you know, it's not a gap that we need an outcome measure just to have an outcome measure. What do we need that outcome measure in? And it's really hard when I look at anything like this, I have to go and translate this into um, really thinking about what is it that happens in an outpatient program. And I just would suggest that we think about uh, reorganizing how we look at the measures in a, in a program to identify gaps because this is just, I think, you know, it, it doesn't help us really see where the gaps are. Thank you, Christy. Um, really helpful, at least to me. Any last comments on gaps, folks? Okay. Um, so my annotated agenda says at 5.40, Sean will announce the closing of the muck voting portion of the meeting and turn it over to Akeen. Um, I've got 5.27. So if, if people object, I can hold us out for another 13 minutes. But if there are no objections, I will um, turn it over to Akeen 13 minutes early. I, I think we have unanimous consent, Sean. <laughs> Um, all right, I think we are opening it up one last time for the opportunity to, uh, for public comment on uh, just about any uh, aspect of the conversation that we had today. Uh, the measures, the gap areas that we talked about, um, any comments from the public? All right, hearing none, it is it is looking um, encouraging <laughs> for us uh, wrapping up just a, a little bit early. Um, so um, this has been um, a long uh, and productive day. I uh, have really appreciated uh, the conversations around the individual measures uh, and all of your thoughtful feedback. Uh, let me turn it over to Mike. Uh, colleagues at NQF to talk about um, immediate next steps for our recommendations and delivering the recommendations to CMS. Uh, Matt, do you want to say that? Or sure. Chris, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Th thank you, Keen. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just want to just double check once more because uh, we are a little ahead of schedule, but I just want to um, double check once more for 
any of any members of the public to comment. I know sometimes it may be a little bit difficult to kind of hop off mute and get things ready, situated together. So if there's any members of the public that would like to provide any comments, please do so now. We'll just give a little bit of, a, of an additional pause there. I know some folks provide comments in the chat box. I make sort of copy paste some things. I don't see any. Okay, uh, so hearing none, thank you, Akeem, for, for, for that. Um, yes, uh, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, Chris Dawson. Uh, he will go through summary of the day and next steps. Chris? Thank you, Matt. So as you all can see on this diagram, following the MAP work group meeting this week, uh, the next step later this month on January 25th will be the MAP coordinating committee meeting to review the results from the various MAP work groups and finalize MAP recommendations. Following the MAP coordinating committee meeting, NQF will provide a final report that includes the MAP recommendations on all measures under consideration. And then lastly, the pre-rulemaking pre report will be published in March. Additionally, after this week's MAP work group meeting, a public commenting period will be held beginning this Friday, January 15th through Wednesday, January 20th. After this public commenting period, the MAP coordinating committee will be held on January 25th to review the recommendations made by the MAP work groups and the public comments received before making final recommendations. And these final MAP recommendations will be made in a report to CMS on February 1st. As a reminder, you may contact our team via email at maphospital at qualityforum.org and find all MAP related materials on the project webpage and work group SharePoint site. If there's no, any, uh, if there's no further questions, um, I'll turn it back over to Sean and Akeem. Okay. Um, let me again thank all of you for taking a full day out of your schedule to have this uh, important conversation uh, and give CMS uh, incredibly thoughtful feedback on the measure set that they presented. I uh, really appreciated the conversation and I, I strongly sus suspect my colleagues from CMS do as well. Uh, let me also thank uh, my partner in crime, Sean, uh, for his incredible facilitation skills. And last but not least, uh, I wanna thank the NQF staff uh, for turning all of this around so quickly uh, and so coherently for all of us. It, it makes this process so much easier. Uh, and of course, thank you to the developers and to CMS uh, for uh, listening and participating as thoughtfully um, as you did throughout the course of the, the meeting. Um, let me kick it over to Sean. Yeah, thanks, Akeen. I just echo everything that Akeen said and also wanted to thank Akeen. This has been um, just an absolute joy to work with him through this process um, and particularly the challenges of doing this for Zoom. Um, I did want to particularly thank our colleagues from CMS, um, from CDC and the folks not on um, from FDA. This has been an unbelievably challenging year for so many people. Um, in the federal government who have been focused on the healthcare of our nation. And I can't imagine what it's been like to go to work every day with everything that you guys have been facing, but I wanted to thank you on behalf of the committee for the work that you have done for our patients and families this year, and quite honestly, for sticking with it, given um, everything that you've been experiencing. So, um, and for being here today and being so, um, good spirited and good natured. So thanks, thank you very much. Actually, Sean and Akeen, if I could just on behalf of CMS say thank you to all of you as well. Um, this has certainly been quite the challenging year, quite honestly, I hope we never see another one like it. Um, 
but everybody, everybody has risen to the occasion. I think certainly frontline healthcare providers, healthcare organizations, certainly we at CMS, the FDA and many other places have just tried very hard. I will tell you it's been 24 hours a day uh, frequently. CMS at least has tried to provide waivers and, and thoughtful consideration as to how to make it easier for healthcare organizations to work from things like hospitals without walls to the expansion of telehealth to other appropriate waivers, licensing across state lines. And I think these things will persist and that's going to change the face of healthcare really forever for the future. To everybody today, thank you so much for taking the time um, and for your incredibly, incredibly thoughtful comments. I always learn from these groups and, and really appreciate it. Appreciate all of the folks uh, who've been on the line and certainly to NQF, what a great, uh, a great day this has been, the rural health and, and I'm sure tomorrow as well. I think NQF has really done a spectacular job in a very short time frame of turning around a lot of information. So thank you to you. Thank you all very much for all of your time. I echo everything that has been shared. Um, thank you to our CMS and CDC colleagues, as well as everyone on the work group. A special thanks to Akeen and Sean for a great facilitation. Uh, we will be following up as the next steps, as Chris has mentioned, but we will go ahead and adjourn early. Everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your week. And thank you all very much for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.